Uh, hello, uh, good evening to all of you. Good evening to all dear students. Sorry for being a bit late. There was some technical issue. So just let me know in the comment section if my audio, video, everything is perfect. All good? Okay, right. All right. So today we are starting a very, very important session. Um, in final MBBS across India, we know that uh, the most uh, hot long case is a case of hemiplegia. And um, in today's session, um, I'm going to make the history taking very simple for you. And um, we'll go in a simplified manner. So uh, yeah, thank you, Shafi. Thank you so much. Yeah, everyone ready? Just give me a thumbs up in the chat box if you are ready. I want your full attention. This will be a conceptual class. Stay relaxed. Just use your logic. We are going to go in a simple, basic manner. Okay, right. Let's start. Now, coming to the outline of the session. Okay. Now, uh, let me just share my screen, okay? Okay, so coming to the outline of the session, I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's go straight to the session. So what is the outline of the session? How to take a proper history in a case of hemiplegia? So I will be giving you a sample case scenario of one of our own cases so that um, you get to know how a proper case history is taken. Second, I will analyze the case history symptom by symptom. Okay, so it will be a step-by-step -step symptom analysis. And I'll teach you how a clinician thinks while approaching a long case and how he comes to conclusions. Third, I know that when you go to exams, after learning all this, you want a checklist. So I'll give you a quick checklist as well that will help you take a quick history in your exams. Then we go for making a provisional diagnosis from the history. Because as you know, when it comes to MBBS prof practical exams, at the end of history, many examiners might ask you, okay, what is your diagnosis from the history? So I'll tell you how to summarize the history and also I'll tell you how to make a diagnosis. Okay, right. So uh, let's start. Okay, please be with me. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's giving this session an open mind that is going to help you. Just stay relaxed. Okay, I'll be teaching you everything right from basics. Patient is Mr. Vinod. It's a name that I've put arbitrarily. 68-year-old male, hailing from Trivandrum, Kerala. Previously was an engineer. Date of admission, 20th March, 2023. Date of examination, 21st March, 2023. Informant is the patient and his wife. I just want to tell you something. See, when you take a history for your long case, it is important to mention all these details 
like when was the patient admitted and when you are examining because the time you are examining and the time the patient came to the hospital the symptoms might slightly vary there might be some improvement of symptoms after coming to the hospital sometimes there might be worsening of symptoms so admission examination important then you've got to mention who is the informant now this is applicable for any long case sometimes what can happen is say a patient presents with some symptoms and uh, suppose the history is not given by an eyewitness of the incident the reliability of that history will be relatively less so you've got to mention who is the informant as well so here it is the patient and his wife okay uh, i request all students attending the session to please share the link of the session in your batch groups as well so that nobody misses out right fine let's go forward so what are the presenting complaints uh, in the in this case before i proceed let me tell you i have given all the students a workbook pdf uh, in case you are attending the session uh, you know if you are not in any of my groups i'll share it after the session but currently i have shared it in my whatsapp groups and also in my telegram group i have put that workbook pdf so all the images are there in that pdf all you have got to do is add on to the pdf so i want to make it very simple for you so let us look at the presenting complaints weakness of right upper limb and lower limb of one day duration and slurring of speech of one day duration students in that uh, in that uh, word document that i have given to you you have got the history and also in the pdf workbook we'll do the other part okay so history of present illness patient was apparently normal until 6 am in the morning when he woke up from sleep this was the prior day okay one day before okay five minutes later after brushing his teeth while he was walking to the toilet he felt that his right lower lip was getting weak he felt heaviness and dragging of his right lower lip he was um, uh, however able to walk of his own though with slight difficulty in the next two hours he noticed dropping of objects from the right hand and difficulty in raising the right upper limb another two hours later while attempting to walk he fell down and noticed that he was not able to walk of his own and required the assistance of two persons also since then he was not able to move his right upper limb at that time his wife noticed that there was deviation of angle of mouth to the left there was drooling of saliva from the right corner of his mouth there was no difficulty in eye closure wife then noticed that his speech became slurred and was not as legible as before no reduction of word output during conversation however he was obeying all commands told to him no sensory symptoms no history suggestive of other cranial nerve involvement no headache vomiting seizures no vertigo no bladder symptoms uh, no chest pain palpitations no loss of consciousness or impairment in consciousness no fever night sweats and weight loss no cough hemoptysis no breathlessness no bed sores the patient was brought to the hospital within 9 hours of onset of symptoms no further progression or improvement of the disability over the past one day okay this is the history of the patient now my dear students we'll move on to the remaining part of the history in a short while but let us try to analyze now open your workbook that i have given you now look at this i am going to analyze it symptom by symptom i told you i am going to tell what a clinician thinks when a patient tells a particular symptom to him we'll start off with the presenting complaints presenting complaints weakness of right upper limb and lower limb of one day and slurring of speech of one day duration now you tell me on hearing this symptom as a clinician what should come to my mind can you tell me just type in the comment section okay so we have almost 1500 students who are attending this session live so happy to see that 
So I'll tell you the uh, analysis. Okay, the analysis is this is a short duration neurological illness in an elderly male presenting with motor and speech symptoms. Sometimes the examiner might ask you just based on presenting symptoms, okay, what did you understand so far? You might simply say, sir, this is a case of stroke. Please don't jump into premature assumptions. Only say based on whatever data is available. See, when I see this presenting complaints, which is just of one day duration, I'm very sure that this is a short duration neurological illness. So it's one day. So do you think I will entertain etiologies like Parkinson's disease, dementia in this case? What do you think? Are they short duration illnesses or longer duration illnesses? You tell me short duration or longer duration. They are longer duration. So this information will help me come to conclusions. So I am thinking of a short duration neurological illness. Obviously, the system I have to identify, it is a weakness of right upper and lower limb. Correct? No. You have got to first come to simple conclusions and then we'll go forward. So it is a short duration neurological illness in an elderly male in the form of what symptoms? In the form of motor and speech symptoms. That is the analysis just based on the presenting complaints. As a clinician, if I see this patient quickly, I ask the presenting complaints, this came to my mind. Fine, let's move forward. I am coming to the history of present illness. Now here, what I'm trying to do is, I am dividing the big history that I gave you into small parts. Be with me, be attentive. I'm going to analyze it part by part. Patient was apparently normal until 6 a.m. in the morning, right? 6 a.m. in the morning when he woke up from sleep. So when he woke up from sleep, he had no problem. Five minutes later, after brushing his teeth, till now he's perfectly fine. While he was walking to the toilet, what did he feel? He felt that his right lower limb was getting weak. Okay, so he felt heaviness and dragging of his right lower limb. Okay, he was, however, able to walk of his own, though with slight disability. Now you tell me, dear students, up to this much when you read, what comes to your mind? What is your analysis? You might ask me, why sir is analyzing it part by part? Well, that is how it goes in practical exam. It's not like you tell the entire uh, history of present illness and then the examiner asks you. He will interrupt you in between and ask you, okay, what did you understand from this? So you might have a tendency quickly to say diagnosis. I know that in the chat box also, the moment I showed the case, I saw so many comments coming down, stroke, stroke, stroke. Well, the examiner is least bothered about it. He knows that, okay, everybody, even, you know, the person who has kept the case, you know, you know somebody who is the, uh, you know, the skilled assistant will tell you, okay, this is a case of stroke. So identifying that this is a stroke is not the big deal here. How you are able to take a proper history and come to conclusions. You tell me what is your conclusion here. I'll tell you what my analysis is. See, uh, my analysis is, this is a, firstly, it is an acute onset neurological illness because 6 a.m. completely normal. 6, 5 a.m. almost normal. He walks to the washroom. Suddenly he develops symptoms. So I got it. It's an acute onset neurological illness. All this is important. In that case, will you think of a Parkinson's disease, dementia? Will you think of those etiologies? No, I am only going to think of an acute onset neurological illness. Now coming to the point here. See, he is having a weakness because he felt that his right lower limb was getting weak. Correct? No? Yes. But there is a problem with this. When it comes to weakness in neurology, you must understand that there are two types of weaknesses. One is a UMN weakness or the upper motor neuron weakness. And the second one is an LMN weakness. So what are the two types of neurological weaknesses? 
UMN weakness or the upper motor neuron weakness and LMN weakness or the lower motor neuron weakness. Okay. Now, my dear students, what do you think is this? Is this an upper motor neuron type of weakness or a lower motor neuron type of weakness? What do you think? See, when I look at this history, I'm seeing that the patient is having heaviness and dragging of right lower limb. Well, patients who are having an upper motor neuron type of weakness. So this is the type of weakness where the patient might feel that his limb is becoming heavy. So there is some sort of heaviness. Okay, He might feel that his limb is like a log of wood. Okay, He might feel. I'm not saying every patient might feel. But if it is, it is suggestive of a UMN weakness. Heaviness like a log of wood. Along with that, patient may also have dragging of the lips. So if there is any dragging, that is also suggestive of a UMN weakness. There is one slight exception. When you get a foot drop, which is an element type of weakness, which can occur in element type of weakness, patient has a tendency to drag, agreed. But majorly, when there are symptoms of heaviness and dragging, it is suggestive of a UMN pattern of weakness. So what did I understand? This is likely to be a UMN weakness. Whereas LMN weakness means it is mostly a flaccid weakness. Okay, So patient will not have any features of heaviness, dragging, it's mostly like a flaccid. The limb feels very much flaccid. That is what happens in LMN weakness. But my dear friends, sometimes you might get fooled because some cases of UMN weakness can present with a flaccid weakness. So remember, UMN weakness also can sometimes present with flaccid weakness. Can you tell me in the chat box, what is that scenario? What is that scenario where UMN weakness is presenting with flaccid weakness? You tell me, UMN flaccid weakness. This is present in the stage of neuronal shock. I'm sure you would have learned this in your physiology lessons about the neuronal shock stage. So some patients after a UMN lesion, suddenly there might be a loss of tone. Normally in upper motor neuron lesions, the tone increases. There is hypertonia. Usually there is hypertonia. And LMN lesions, usually there is hypotonia. But in the stage of neuronal shock, you might have a UMN lesion having a hypotonia. But but here you tell me, is the patient currently in neuronal shock? Yes or no? Yes or no? Answer is no. The patient is not in neuronal shock because I am seeing words like heaviness. I am seeing words like dragging. I am seeing words like heaviness. I am seeing words like dragging. So no chance. No chance. This is a UMN weakness. So the analysis is, it is a UMN spastic weakness of the right lower limb. Now, here I want to just introduce this word to you, spasticity. Okay. See, what I want to, you to understand is, majorly, when you think of upper motor neuron lesions, okay, I'm sure that some of my dear students may not know what is an upper motor neuron. Do not worry. I am coming to it. It will be clear to you. Okay. So, uh, because in my class, I want everyone to understand, everyone to learn. So, in upper motor neuron weakness, please understand, majorly happens due to a pyramidal pathway lesion. So, you have got the pyramidal tract, heard of it, which is also known as, what is the other name? Corticospinal tract. Corticospinal tract. Okay, so majorly UMN lesion means there is a lesion in the corticospinal tract. But I am just leaving a small space here. 
there is one more UMN lesion which I will be coming to in a very short while. Okay, for the time being, majority of the UMN lesions are due to corticospinal tract affection. Got it. Now, so uh, you know that UMN pyramidal tract lesions, they are very well known to produce a spasticity. Okay, they are known to produce a spasticity. So you are having in this case a spastic weakness. Sir, how you understood, sir, it is spastic. You have not even examined the patient because the patient gave me a symptom of heaviness and dragging. So I understood that the tone is increased. Now the look at the last sentence. He was, however, able to walk of his own, though with slight difficulty, which means at this point, I understood at this point, the patient is not having a severely disabling weakness at this point. Okay. So we'll see the rest of the history, but this is my analysis based on these symptoms. Okay. Right. Fantastic. Let's move forward. And uh, when I move forward, I am just going to give you some more ideas on my dear students who are having doubts on, sir, what is this upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron? Heard of it in physiology, but not getting the exact concept now. I'll teach you what it is. Now, look at this. Okay. In the workbook that I gave you, we have got this image. So, this is the lateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere. And what you are seeing is that you are seeing a central sulcus. My dear students, are you seeing a central sulcus here? There is a central sulcus. So, behind the central sulcus, you have got the sensory area. Are you seeing the primary somatosensory cortex? That is the area 3, 1, and 2. Are you seeing it? That is a primary somatosensory cortex. You have also got the parietal association cortex and also the secondary somatosensory area as well. In front of the central sulcus, you have got the motor area, correct? You have got the important area, the Broadman area 4. Heard of Broadman area? Broadman area, Broadman area 4. That is the primary motor cortex. You have also got the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex. Okay, fine so far. I just want you to keep in mind the primary motor cortex. Okay, understood. I am just giving you another view of the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere. My dear students, look at the primary motor cortex. Look at the supplementary motor area and look at the primary somatosensory cortex, all of which were present in the lateral surface. They are extending into the medial surface as well. You might ask me, why sir is teaching all this, uh, these structures? Because to understand conceptually this topic and to localize properly in a systematic manner, some basics you have got to know. No need to know everything. Only what I am teaching you, you should know that. And you just have a look at the parietal association cortex as well. Got it? Again, I want you to have a special focus on the primary motor cortex, Broadman area 4. Right? Now, my dear students, you should understand that from this motor cortex, there are certain descending fibers. Okay? Descending tract, I can call it. Okay? So you see here, this is the precentral gyrus. Why precentral? It is in front of the central sulcus. So in front of the central sulcus, you have got the precentral gyrus. And you are having descending pathways from the precentral gyrus. Can you see them coming down? Can you see them coming down? So this comes down and this goes through an important area. Who is going to tell me? What is the name of this important area through which the descending motor pathway goes? This is the internal capsule. And you know that the pyramidal tract or the corticospinal tract goes through the genu and the anterior two-third. Genu and the anterior two-third of the posterior limb. Let me repeat it once again. You have got the internal capsule, which has got an anterior limb, a genu, a posterior limb, retrolentiform part and sublentiform part. Remember the physiology is part of the internal capsule, anterior limb, genu, posterior limb, retrolentiform part and sublentiform part. 
Now through the genu and the posterior limb, which part of the posterior limb? Anterior two third of the posterior limb, you've got the descending pathway, motor pathway. So this descends through the same side, through the internal capsule, then goes down, goes to the brain stem. Where does the brain stem start? Midbrain. Goes through the ipsilateral midbrain, ipsilateral pons, ipsilateral medulla, but in the lower part of the medulla, it crosses to the opposite side. It crosses to the opposite side. And this crossing, what can I call it? I'll call it the pyramidal decusation. I'll call it the pyramidal decusation. Have you uh, learned about the medullary pyramids? Yes, the bulge that is produced by the, the bulge that is produced by the uh, pyramidal tract in the medulla. Remember that? So it crosses to the opposite side and then descends, then descends. So then after medulla, what do you have? You have got the spinal cord. So it will go through the spinal cord. Which part of the spinal cord? Spinal cord in the center has a gray matter and periphery has a white matter. This will go through the white matter. So it goes through the lateral part of the spinal cord. So it is the lateral corticospinal tract. Remember, I told you about the pyramidal decusation. Okay. So does 100% of the corticospinal tract cross at the medulla? No. 80% will cross to the opposite side. How much? How much did I say? 80% will cross to the opposite side. At the same time, 20% of these fibers will not cross and will go through the same side of medulla and spinal cord. So 80% that crosses is known as the lateral corticospinal tract. And you tell me the 20% that does not cross is known as what? The ventral corticospinal tract. So lateral corticospinal tract and ventral corticospinal tract. Sir, why such a division, sir? Because the lateral corticospinal tract is important for fine skilled movements. It is important for fine skilled movements. Whereas the ventral corticospinal tract is important for the regulation of the regulation of tone of axial muscles. Axial muscles. See, Dr. Rahul is able to take this class sitting in an erect posture. My axial muscles, this, these are appendicular muscles. This is the axial muscles. So my axial muscles at the back, they are having a good tone, which is why I'm able to maintain a posture, right? So this ventral corticospinal tract will help in regulation of the tone of the axial muscles. Got it? Fantastic. Now, what happens is this lateral corticospinal tract, which is descending, will go through the white matter of the spinal cord, but it will finally end by synapsing in the gray matter of the spinal cord. So they were descending through the white matter, but it will synapse with the uh, lower motor neuron in the gray matter of spinal cord. Sir, where does it synapse? Sir? It differs depending on which muscle is going to be supplied. See, the corticospinal tract that is descending will be having motor fibers to the upper limb, lower limb, trunk, everything, right? So the muscles which are destined to supply the upper limb, what will happen? These fibers which will descend will reach the cervical part of the spinal cord, will synapse with the corresponding lower motor neurons. And from there, the lower motor neurons will supply the upper limb muscles. What about the remaining muscles, remaining fibers that are destined to supply the lower limbs? They'll keep going down. They'll keep going down through the white matter of the spinal cord as the lateral corticospinal tract. And at the corresponding levels where it has got to supply, that 
level alone it will come to the gray matter of the spinal cord and synapse with the lower motor neuron okay so this one is known as the upper motor neuron so my dear students this entire extend from the cortex okay the motor cortex it is upper motor neuron so from the motor cortex the descending pathway that reaches till the level of the uh, at the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord you will call it upper motor neuron and after that you have got there is a synapse there so at the end of a synapse you will have another efferent coming so this fiber that comes out is known as the lower motor neuron okay so i will come to some more details about lower motor neuron please wait okay so so far am i making sense so far am i making sense just give me a thumbs up so far am i making sense yes just one more point i want to add to you same picture guys i'm just showing you different images okay so you look at this the the, the violet lines are corresponding to certain descending fibers correct and if you closely look at these descending fibers you will see that they are having from the cortex when they come down they are having a fan shape correct so these fibers these descending motor fibers they are having a fan shape and what do you call it my dear students what do you call it this is known as the corona radiata this is known as the corona radiata which is a fan shaped structure which is a fan shaped structure corona radiata so it starts off in the cortex then comes through the corona radiata finally it converges into the region of internal capsule where all the fibers are densely crowded comes down to the level of midbrain pons medulla crosses to the opposite side descends through the white matter of the spinal cord as the lateral corticospinal tract 80 percentage and at whichever region it has got to supply will synapse with the lower motor neuron of the spinal cord and once again just enjoy the beauty of the spinal cord the section of the spinal cord this is the anterior part this is the posterior part you can see that in the white matter of the spinal cord there are different pathways and who is this one who is this one this is the lateral corticospinal tract lateral corticospinal tract and who is this guy going here this is the anterior corticospinal tract and i gave another name to it a while back which is the ventral corticospinal tract both are the same you can call it anterior corticospinal tract or ventral corticospinal tract sir i am seeing some more tracks sir like lateral spinothalamic anterior spinothalamic we come to all those relax no problem for the time being my interest is on the corticospinal tract why because we are analyzing the symptom of weakness and trying to identify what is a umn weakness and what is a lmn weakness so we are just diving deep into the topic just to have a solid understanding right you see the dorsal column of the uh, spinal cord as well and central part you have got the gray matter so in the brain the white matter is in the center and gray matter is outside in the spinal cord gray matter is in the center and white matter is outside right now i told you about upper motor neuron there is one more added point on upper motor neuron i want to discuss with you so the first point i told you was upper motor neuron is up to the level of the uh, the lower motor neuron in this spinal cord right but there is one more addition i want to make here see this is again taken from the textbook and you see here again same figure i was discussing about this uh, corticospinal tract which comes down in the medulla goes to the opposite side descends now correct that i already discuss but remember you have got brain stem right in brain stem which consists of midbrain pons and medulla what is so unique about the brain stem structures you tell me what is so unique about brain stem 
what makes it very special tell me what makes it very special midbrain pons and medulla what makes it very special it houses lot of cranial nerve nuclei it has lot of cranial nerve nuclei for example in the midbrain you have got cranial nerve 3 and 4 in the pons you get 5 6 7 8 and in the medulla you get 9 10 okay i'm very poor in mathematics 9 10 11 and 12 okay so uh, these cranial nerve nuclei are there and don't you think these cranial nerve nuclei also require innervation from cortex yes so basically my dear students i want to introduce another pathway just like the cortico spinal tract i talked about there is another pathway from the cortex which goes crosses to the opposite side and synapses with the cranial nerve nuclei sir crosses at which side well depends on which cranial nerve nuclei it supplies if it is the third nerve nuclei it will cross just before the midbrain if it is sixth nerve nuclei it will cross just before pons if it is say 10th nerve nuclei it will cross just before medulla so it will cross and synapse with the cranial nerve nuclei at that level of the midbrain you tell me what is the name of that tract yes as dr rohit mohan is rightly telling those tracts are referred to as cortico bulbar tracts what do you call them you will call them as the cortico cortico bulbar tract so remember bulb per se means medulla but in neurology when you say majority of these bulbar points it mainly means the brain stem strictly speaking bulb is medulla but generally cortico bulbar means fibers from the cortex to the cranial nerve nuclei in the brain stem so my dear students what i want to tell you is when we discuss about upper motor neuron upper motor neuron or i want you to understand that umn means umn means it includes the pyramidal tract that is or the cortico spinal tract but in addition to that please also count the cortico bulbar tract even the cortico bulbar tract is an upper motor neuron okay even the cortico bulbar tract is an upper motor neuron very clear yes now now so you understood about cortico bulbar tract so this will come these tracts will come and synapse with the lower motor neurons my dear students what are the lower motor neurons you are aware of you've got the alpha motor neuron and the gamma motor neuron alpha motor neuron and the gamma motor neuron so what is why do you have two motor neurons why alpha and gamma why not just one motor neuron they subserve different functions alpha is mainly concerned with the muscle strength alpha is the mainly concerned with the muscle strength and gamma is mainly concerned with muscle tone gamma is mainly concerned with muscle tone there is a bit of alpha gamma linkage as well don't think that they are enemies and doing their own functions they have got good linkage between themselves but these lower motor neurons are the ones which supply the muscles okay alpha motor neuron and gamma motor neuron. so where where are these motor neurons located they will originate in the gray matter of the spinal cord correct that is after the synapse okay right so this picture is just showing you might ask me sir what is this afferent neuron you tell me you remember the picture of muscle spindle so these are very important in regulation of muscle spindle as well remember in physiology studying about the intrafusal fibers and extrafusal fibers yes right yeah i can see someone getting you know the nostalgia of first year mbbs about uh, you know the extrafusal and intrafusal the time when you had so much urge to study right and somewhere 
did that urge go a bit down? Don't worry, we are just going to regain everything back. Okay, right. So once again, a look at the beautiful section of the spinal cord, just to enjoy it. I want you to notice something. You know, I told you the alpha motor neuron is originating from the gray matter. So this will form the ventral root. You see, what is it forming? Ventral root. And you see there is a sensory root as well here, which is known as the dorsal root. So the ventral root is sensory and the dorsal, sorry, ventral root is motor and the dorsal root is sensory. Okay, this is a motor root and this is a sensory root because we know the spinal nerves are mixed nerves. So you've got to have contribution from both. So these will join and will form the spinal nerve. The dorsal root and ventral root will join and form the spinal nerve, right? And I just want you to understand, have a look at this section once again, okay? I hope you are with me, everyone, just stay awake, okay, with me, just let's enjoy the subject. So you look at the spinal cord, okay, I'll just tell you the orientation. This is ventral part. Yes, this is dorsal part. Yes, ventral, dorsal. And uh, this is the vertebral body. And you tell me which structure is there here? Which structure is there here? You tell me which structure is there. You will have the intervertebral disc. Intervertebral disc. Right? Now, you are seeing here, this is the ventral root I was talking about. This is the dorsal root. This will join to form the spinal nerve. But remember, after it becomes the spinal nerve, it will give a ventral ramus and a dorsal ramus. Sir, 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 what? After it forms the spinal nerve, it will form a ventral ramus and dorsal ramus. Sir, ramus means root, no? Yes, ramus means root. Sir, what, sir? You were talking about ventral root and dorsal root. Now you say there is another ventral root and dorsal root. Well, that is the true fact. There are two types of roots. Okay. So there is a ventral and dorsal root, spinal nerve. Again, there is a ventral and dorsal ramus, which is also often called a ventral root and dorsal root. Okay. Right. Now, the dorsal ramus is very, very small. The ventral ramus is more thick. So the dorsal ramus will go and mainly supply the axial muscles of the back. The ventral ramus will continue. Okay, now it is the ventral ramus you have got to keep in mind because my dear students, another beautiful picture coming your way, you can see that there are segments of the spinal cord, C1, C2, you're seeing that, no? Spinal cord is there. What is C1, C2? What are these spinal segments? I'm going to teach you about a spinal segment. What is a spinal segment? Spinal segment means the length of the spinal cord, which gives rise to one spinal nerve is known as a spinal segment. Okay, which means if I have got C1 spinal segment, there is a nerve coming from it. Sir, which is this new nerve, sir? Nothing, man. The ventral ramus you talked about, no, that is called. The, vent the dorsal man is just a small character. The main character is the ventral rami. You will call that as the spinal nerve. So that ventral rami of the C1 nerve is there. Ventral rami of C2, that is coming out through the foramen. Okay. So through this intervertebral foramen, between the vertebra, you have got gaps and the spinal nerves come on each side. How many pairs of spinal nerves? How many pairs of spinal nerves are there? 31 pairs of spinal nerves are there. Right? Fantastic. So you've got all these spinal nerves coming out of these vertebrae. Now, my dear students, these spinal nerves, I can spot another picture here. C5 spinal nerve, C6 spinal nerve. I can even call it root, 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 root. C5, C6, C7, C8. These are C5 root. You tell me, is this the first root I am talking about or that second root? 
okay in the previous story that i was telling you about two roots which is this root is it the first root or the second root i'm just going to ask you just to see if you're sleeping or not tell me the first one or the second one. first one or the second one. good it is the second one so the c5 root c5 c6 c7 c8 these will form what plexus right you will have a plexus because the c5 to t1 roots or the ventral roots of c5 to t1 will form the beautiful brachial plexus will form the beautiful brachial plexus and brachial plexus will give rise to peripheral nerves lot of peripheral nerves radial nerve ulnar nerve medial nerve so many nerves okay right so that is what happens now you have got to know what is the elimination because the reason why i said this entire story is to make you understand what is an upper motor neuron and what is a lower motor neuron so upper motor neuron means see sorry lower motor upper motor neuron you are clear now what is a lower motor neuron one is an anterior horn cell correct no because that is where an element starts anterior horn cell after that you have got the root okay root so i am going to tell you an element lesion means any one of the following is affected either the anterior horn cell or the root or the plexus or from the plexus you get peripheral nerves originating or the peripheral nerve can go and synapse with the muscle at the neuromuscular junction and then you can have muscle so element lesion for example you tell me anterior horn cell is affected in which disease motor neuron disease heard of motor neuron disease which is a degenerative disorder it can sometimes affect the umn as well but yes this is one disorder that can affect element root means what when a root is affected you get a disease that is known as radiculopathy you might have seen some people having a root I mean shock like pain in a distribution of a nerve root why does this often happen for example they are having a disc disease intervertebral disc prolapse ivdp you might have seen maybe one of your friend is having it they might or you yourself may be having it they might tell in between i get a shock like pain radiating so radiculopathy is a shock like pain radiculopathy is a shock like pain my dear students have a look at the workbook i have these places i have left empty spaces in the workbook please add on so it is a shock like pain so this happens in a disc disease why because remember in this picture that i showed you i told you where the disc is and what can happen is this disc can bulge and when this bulges in this direction because your orthopedics faculty would have taught you the most common site of a disc bulge is posterior lateral posterior laterally there is a disc bulge right so if if the most common site was posterior disc bulge you tell me if it is a posterior disc bulge which structure will be compressed you tell me i am waiting for your answer if it was a posterior disc bulge which structure would have been affected you tell me which structure spinal cord but the most common disc bulge is posterior laterally which is by the root will get affected in this direction okay in this direction the disc bulges and the root will get affected and you get a radiculopathy okay but sometimes it can go posteriorly and cause even a spinal cord affection which is a myelopathy sometimes but disc when it goes posterior laterally causes radiculopathy now plexus you can have a brachial plexopathy maybe after road traffic accidents you get plexopathies diabetes can sometimes lead on to plexopathies when there is a cancer of um, say the apex of the lung it can infiltrate into the plexus heard of pancreas tumor okay heard of pancreas tumor you tell me pancreas tumor where the lower trunk is affected so that is again infiltration into this uh, part of the plexus peripheral nerve can be affected as in case of 
diabetic neuropathy exam i'm just giving you example of each diabetic neuropathy neuromuscular junction myasthenia gravis mg myasthenia gravis in your exam don't say mg i can say mg because i have passed the exam but when you say your examiner will tell you what is this short note okay what is this short form i don't understand this don't worry even the examiner might use the same term but during your exams you know use all the full terminologies now coming to muscle disease you can have myopathies different type of muscle diseases are there okay which uh, you might have learned in your theory so these are the lmn lesions so anterior horn cell root plexus peripheral nerve neuromuscular junction muscle any of them is affected you will call it an lmn lesion umn lesion means anything above the alpha motor neuron or the gamma motor neuron that is called an lmn lesion okay so far it is clear now let me try to tell you uh, the difference you know between a umn weakness and lmn weakness some points i told you one is a spastic weakness flaccid weakness the other point i want to tell you is the pyramidal pattern of weakness or the pyramidal distribution of weakness let me try to make you understand what is that what is this pyramidal distribution of the weakness okay pyramidal distribution of weakness means you know this pyramidal tract is a very partial tract okay it is not supplying all the muscles equally there is an unequal distribution which is why when there is a umn lesion all muscles are not affected the same because in a umn lesion or an upper motor neuron lesion you get a so called pyramidal distribution of weakness where the weakness is predominantly of the extensors of upper limb and the flexors of the lower limb so in the upper limb the flex the extensors you tell me triceps is it an extensor or flexor it is an extensor biceps is a flexor so in case of a typical umn lesion which will be more weak is it the triceps or biceps the extensor is more weak so triceps will be more weak than biceps similarly elbow flexors wrist flexors finger flexors everything if you look the weakness will be sparing the flexors it will be mainly for the extensors so this is body's adaptation just to spare the anti gravity muscles okay just to spare the anti gravity muscles okay so umn weakness or pyramidal weakness spares the anti gravity muscles now you might ask me sir i have a doubt sir what is that doubt my doubt is i have seen patients in my ward not even able to move a finger after a stroke not even able to move a finger why does that happen sir i have seen patients you said there is a differential distribution of weakness i have seen patients where biceps triceps everything is zero power well that can happen so if there is a severe pyramidal lesion if there is a severe pyramidal lesion then what happens is it affects both the flexors and extensors equally severe pyramidal lesion affects the flexors and extensors equally okay i hope you understood now this is just a picture of my patient who had a stroke some time back there is a video of this maybe in my whatsapp group or telegram group i'll be discussing this but um, you just uh, look at this picture you see the patient is having a flexed posture of the right upper limb why is she having this because patients after a stroke sometimes develop this attitude of a right upper limb flexion because extensor muscles i told you are weak so more power is there for the flexor muscles tone is also more for the flexor muscles so they will have such an attitude whereas the lower limb you know the upper limb the extensors are weak lower limb the flexors are weak so they will be having a extended posture so this is the posture you are having and all my dear students who are attending the class just stay relaxed be with me okay i will always advise you to sit today and finish this topic now 
if you feel sir i watch after some time well interrupted learning is not always good always stay at one place focus understand learn and then revise tomorrow itself okay so i hope you understood conceptually why stroke patients keep like this maybe if you want me to share this video of the patient's gait i'll do it in my group as well okay so how she walks with the typical hemiplegic gait okay hemiplegic gait and what is the other name of hemiplegic gait my dear students tell me what is the other name of the hemiplegic gait it is also referred to as the circumduction gait okay circumduction gait okay circumduction gait right so this is about um and weakness lm and weakness now you remember sometime back when i taught you about upper motor neuron i left a gap here so the gap here was for a specific reason there is something that is known as extra pyramidal tract something known as the extra pyramidal tract now what is this tract what is this extra pyramidal tract look at the word extra pyramidal so other than the pyramidal tract so basically all descending tracts all descending tracts except corticospinal tract and corticobulbar tract they are called extra pyramidal tracts all descending tracts except corticospinal and corticobulbar sir i did not understand sir some descending tract which descending tracts are you are talking about not understanding why you are not showing pictures sir i'll show you see this is a picture from harrison harrison is a very simple textbook very simple only thing is that you have got to understand conceptually i'll teach you now harrison is showing you the cortico spinal tract yes it comes down lower part of medulla crosses now i want you to focus on the fact that there are certain nuclei in this picture one is a red nucleus i can see reticular nucleus i can see vestibular nucleus so there are certain nuclei and where are they located they are located in the brain stem understood they are located in the brain stem so these nuclei are having connections connections with certain important structures which are located somewhere here so they are having certain connections with the basal ganglia okay they are having connections with the bg basal ganglia so which is why you know no i'll complete that sentence a bit later wait so you have got the basal ganglia there now what is this basal ganglia remember basal ganglia basal ganglia has certain important structures basal ganglia has certain important structures you see here caudate nucleus you see putamen globus pallidus subthalamic nucleus substantia nigra so basal ganglia is not a single structure don't think that in the brain there is one beautiful small structure called basal ganglia sitting up there no they are an army they are a constellation there are multiple structures that constitute the basal ganglia one caudate nucleus two you have got the putamen putamen okay globus pallidus which has a globus pallidus interna and a globus pallidus externa you have got the subthalamic below the thalamus subthalamic nucleus and in the midbrain you have got substantia nigra you have got substantia nigra so these are the structures of the basal ganglia why sir is telling about all these basal ganglia structures he was teaching some extra pyramidal pathway there is a reason for that as i told you the basal ganglia is having very good connections with these nuclei that i told about red nucleus reticular nucleus vestibular nucleus there are connections between basal ganglia and these structures okay and from these nuclei you have got various tracts as well red nucleus to spinal cord rubro spinal tract reticular nucleus to spinal cord reticulo spinal tract vestibular nuclei onwards vestibulo spinal tract you have got all these descending tracts got it yes 
So there are descending tracks. So what are these descending tracks? My dear students, this is what you call as the extra pyramidal tract. So in addition to the classical upper motor neuron system, you've got the extra pyramidal upper motor neuron system. And since majority of these tracks originate from the nuclei in brainstem, what name can I call it? A while back I told you, no, brainstem means bulb, bulb. So from the brainstem, the descending pathways are known as bulbospinal pathways. Bulbospinal upper motor neuron. This is the exact word that is used in Addison. Extra pyramidal tract is also known as bulbospinal upper motor neuron system because they are originating from certain nuclei in the brainstem. Now, my dear students, what are these extra pyramidal pathways? Tectospinal pathway, vestibulospinal pathway, reticulospinal pathway, and rubrospinal pathway. These are the extra pyramidal pathway. Sir, you missed something there. Between three and four, I am seeing a space. Why? Because I left it on purpose. The first three are predominantly innervating the proximal muscles. They are friends. They innervate predominantly the proximal muscles. The rubrospinal is innervating mainly the distal muscles. Now you might ask me, hey, what is this? Proximal muscle, distal muscle. Sir, you told a while back, corticospinal tract is giving power. Now you are saying extra pyramidal is also going to muscle. Remember, power is mainly by the pyramidal path, no doubt. But this pyramidal tract, you have got to understand. See, when you get certain movements, let me just tell you. Wait, I'm just stopping sharing the screen, okay? Just look at me. See, what happens is, when I want to move my right upper lip like this, Definitely corticospinal tract is important. But see, when I make movements and I write with a pen, then I change my body position. To have a very smooth, coordinated movement, it's not just about corticospinal tract. You need additional involvement of the basal ganglia and cerebellum. So basal ganglia and cerebellum is important for the fine tuning of the motor activities. To make it smooth, coordinated motor activities, you need the basal ganglia and cerebellum as well. If it was not there, all our movements would have been very crude. So it's not just about power alone. You need smoothness, coordination. Okay. So that is what I'm talking about when I say about these, um, you know, the pathways, the extra pyramidal pathways. Now back to the screen. Let me see. If, yes. Okay. Now you might ask me, so sir, got it. There are some extra pyramidal pathways, bulbospinal pathways, got it. And they are having some good connection with basal ganglia, which is why when you talk about basal ganglia lesion, you sometimes say it is extra pyramidal tract lesion. Why? Because basal ganglia is having so much connections with these extra pyramidal tracts. They are friends, macha macha. So when there is a lesion of the basal ganglia, extra pyramidal pathways are affected, got it? So now you understood what are these extrapyramidal pathways. Now, what are the functions of extrapyramidal pathways? I just told it a while back. I'm just putting it to letters. Number one, it helps in maintenance of poster and tone. Sir, sir, a while back you told ventral corticospinal, that anterior corticospinal also you told is having some tone and poster function. Well, who said that uh, two tracks cannot have the same function? I did not tell you. It can have. So even the extra pyramidal pathway is important for maintenance of poster and tone. Remember Parkinson's disease patient having stooped forward poster. They're not having a good poster because it is an extra pyramidal pathway lesion. They're not able to maintain the poster. Second function, it, may, it makes the voluntary movements more natural and correct. The, a while back, I told you about the smooth coordinated movements, right? So that is point number two. Third, integrated movements of limbs and trunk. Well, when I perform any motor act, see, I'll just again stop the sharing. See, when I am in front of you and I'm just moving while I take the class, I don't feel that my upper limb and trunk are separate structures. It feels like everything is together, okay? Just like a dance. So uh, there has to be an integration, right? 
This is again a very important function of the extrapyramidal pathways. If you see patients with Parkinson's disease, that sort of a smoothness uh, which integrates the limbs with the trunk is not there. Okay, you will understand once you see more patients with uh, diseases like Parkinson's disease. Okay, right. Ah, right. Now, fourth function, control of reflexes that accompany response to situations. For example, you look at this control of reflexes that accompany the responses to situations. So, see, suppose if I am sitting here, suddenly a fly comes, a big fly comes to me. What is my reflex response? I keep it like this, something like that, right? This is a reflex response like this. So there is an increase in tone as well, right? There is an increase in tone as well. So all these reflex posters, tone, this is again important function of basal ganglia, which is why patients with Parkinson's disease, these reflexes might be less. Their reflexes are less only, okay? So control of reflexes that accompany responses to situations, important function of extrapyramidal pathway. Control of automatic modification of tone and movements, similar to the one that I told you about. In certain situations, automatically your tone increases, something like this, you know, uh, in the giant wheel that you go, you know, you will have such sort of a poster. I'm very scared of going in that. So uh, I go into this particular poster. So these are automatic modification of tone. So that is again a function of extrapyramidal pathway. If you have Parkinson's disease, nothing like that. Or, you know, you sit like this, that's it. Finally, control of movements that are originally voluntary, but then become automatic through exercise and learning like writing. See, when my son started, you know, learning, initially he would write, no, say the word like uh, uh, hen. He would say H-E-N. But as we all grow up, the reflex, it is a reflexly going on thing, right? Writing and all. So what helps us in this reflex? You do not think too much. You just keep on writing. I am teaching you. You're keeping on writing the notes. So it goes in a smooth, coordinated way. So what I'm trying to tell you is this is again a function of the extrapyramidal pathway. Okay. So these are the functions of the extrapyramidal pathways, right? Ah, so we deviated this much only to make you aware of what is a UMN weakness. But my dear students, remember, this is a very important point. Unless otherwise specified, UMN means pyramidal tract. Yes, even extra pyramidal is upper motor neuron, but usually we say UMN means pyramidal tract or the corticospinal tract and also the corticobulbar tract. So normally when you discuss in your exams, mainly you are supposed to say about this, but you should also know about the extrapyramidal tract. Okay, right. Which is why UMN lesions will produce hypertonia. And what sort of a hypertonia is produced by the pyramidal tract lesions? Spasticity. What sort of a hypertonia is produced by extrapyramidal tract lesions? You tell me. What sort of a hypertonia is produced by extrapyramidal tract lesions? It is rigidity. Rigidity. Spasticity, rigidity. Spasticity, rigidity. Right? Yes. So, more differences between spasticity and rigidity in the next class where we discuss about the examination finding. This is mainly about the history. Right? Fine. Done. Let's go to the next part. Okay. There is one table here. I'm just keeping it reserved. I'll be discussing it when, you know, we discuss the examinations in the next class as well. Right? Right. Let's proceed with the history now. Okay. See, uh, I'll take time and I'll explain to you. But this is just one class in your life that you need to hear about this topic. Just one class. That's it. The problem is if you see, you know, why sir is explaining all regarding this. Dear students, only if you understand and learn, you can apply in a patient. You just mug up something here and there. It will never come in handy for you. As I said, all this should come as a reflex. For that, you've got to get the concept. All of you are bright children. If you get information in a systematic way, I'm very confident of your abilities. You will definitely be able to, you know, look at a patient, make your own assumptions and uh, 
diagnosed as well. Okay, right. Let's move forward to the remaining part of the history of present illness. In the span of uh, next two hours, uh, so in the span of next two hours, he noticed dropping of objects from the right hand and difficulty in raising the right upper leg. Okay, okay. Another two hours later, while attempting to walk, he fell down and noticed that he was not able to walk of his own and required the assistance of two persons. Also, since then, he was not able to move his right upper leg. So what is this? Let me tell you. So the analysis here is that, see, now the patient has got motor symptoms in the ipsilateral upper leg. To begin with, symptoms was in the lower limb only, which means now the patient has progressed onto a right hemiplegia. That is my analysis. Okay, because this is exactly what your examiner will ask you. Okay, so now what did you understand? You will keep on saying, sir, stroke, stroke. Examiner will say, no, analyze the history. Tell me what did you understand? You will say diagnosis is stroke. That's not what he wants. That's not what he wants. Okay. Second point I understood is the acute onset event that happened is progressing or evolving. What does that mean? Something that started off with a right lower limb weakness now is involving the right upper limb as well. So there is a progression of symptoms, right? And then there is a severe functional disability. There is a severe functional disability. Now, what does that mean? See, severe functional disability. You remember in the first part of the history of present illness, I told you at that time, the patient was having a milder weakness of the lower limb. But now you are having a progressive weakness, okay? Severe disability is there. Now, I will tell you one common mistake that you make while presenting is, you, you often say, initially weakness was mild, later weakness was severe. See, that is an assumption. What you have got to tell in the history is, something from the history even without you telling it is a mild weakness, exam and understands it is a mild weakness, which is why when I told the, 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 the part before, I told you, you look at this, the first part, he was, however, able to walk off his own, though with slight difficulty, the first part, which I told, but now you see, now you see what has happened to the same patient. Now you see, okay, now you see, he is, he was not able to walk of his own and required the assistance of two persons. Did I ever use the word severe weakness? No, but I could beautifully tell the examiner, dear examiner, the weakness is progressing. The weakness is now very severe. That's what you should understand. Right. So that is about that analysis. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Right. So this is what is my analysis of this part. Can I proceed? Can I proceed? So we are done with the analysis of the motor symptoms. So my dear students, did you get a proper idea? Just give me a thumbs up on how I analyze the motor symptoms analysis and gave the examiner an idea what is happening to the patient. Give me a thumbs up. Right. Let me proceed to the next part of the history. So at that time, the wife noticed that there was a deviation of angle of mouth to the left and there was a drooling of saliva from the right corner of the mouth. There was no difficulty in eye closure. Okay, right. So what is the impression from this? You tell me, what is the impression from this? Drooling of deviation of angle of mouth, drooling from the right corner. See, deviation of angle of mouth to the left. Probably on attempted speaking, there was a deviation of angle of mouth to the left. And from the right corner of the mouth, there was a drooling of saliva. Now, let me just try to analyze. I'm just stopping the sharing of the screen. See, when you smile normally, you show an E, the muscles of the face, okay, they act. Okay, you have got the muscles of the face acting and you are smiling symmetrically. But when there is a weakness of the facial muscles on one side, say, suppose the lower facial muscles on this side, and then I smile, what will happen? This facial muscle is not working. 
So tell you, so it will be like, you know, I'm having the facial deviation. The problem is not here. The problem is the muscles of this side. It's not moving at all. All it is moving is this side. Okay. So that is why there is a deviation of angle of mouth here. Okay. And when I attempt to drink some water, well, this side muscle is okay, but there is a drooling of saliva through this side. Okay. So what did I understand? There is a weakness of facial muscles. Again, don't jump and say facial, facial palsy. First of all, say there is a weakness of the lower facial muscles on the right side. Why I am saying lower facial muscles alone? Why I am saying upper facial muscle is spared? You tell me. Why I am so sure that the upper facial muscle is spared? You tell me. Because there is no difficulty in eye closure. The eye closure, which is a function of the orbicularis oris, is completely normal. So if there was a complete facial muscle palsy, or the entire muscles of one side is affected, eye closure also would have been defected. So I understood one thing. This is not a LMN facial palsy. This is a UMN facial palsy, upper motor neuron type of facial palsy. So what is my impression after this? The analysis is the right UMN facial palsy. Sir, what's a right UMN facial palsy? Means right side facial muscles are weak. Okay, which means it is a right-sided facial palsy. But the lower part is affected, upper part is spare. This happens in a UMN facial palsy. So what will I write here? I will write the impression or the analysis as a right UMN facial palsy. See, whatever I am telling as analysis part is the questions the examiner will ask you. Okay, now tell. So they interrupt you and ask you some questions. No, you might feel when I'm going in a flow, this examiner is interrupting and asking, okay, what did you understand now? You tell me what is your impression. This is what he asks you. You will keep on saying, sir, stroke. Stroke, sir, stroke. I am very sure stroke. That is not what he wants. Okay, fine. Now, for my students who did not understand about this UMN facial palsy, LMN facial palsy, let me make it a bit more clear for you. Okay, please be attentive. So what I'm trying to tell you is, about the difference between a upper motor neuron type of facial palsy and lower motor neuron type of facial palsy. Now, this is very, very important to understand. All my dear students, please have a look at this particular fiber, which comes from the cortex, comes down, and just before the pons, why before pons? Pons is where you get the seventh nerve nuclei. It will cross to the opposite side and it will synapse. Okay, cross to the opposite side and synapse. What do you call this pathway? You tell me. What do you call this pathway? From the cortex to the brainstem cranial nerve nuclei. So it crosses just before that. What do you call this? Cortico bulbar pathway. Okay, cortico bulbar pathway. Right? Right. Now you've got to understand that you've got a pair of facial nerve nucleus, right? in the right side and left side. I am first going to talk about the facial nerve nucleus that is located on the left side. Okay, Not about this case, I am talking in general. Now, when you look at this facial nerve nucleus, I am drawing it separately now for better clarity. See, facial nerve nucleus on each side will have an upper part and a lower part. It will have an upper part and a lower part. Okay. It will happen upper part and the lower part. What you've got to understand is the upper part of the facial nerve nucleus will have a bilateral innervation by which I mean, let me draw this upper part here. So the upper part is going to get supply from both cerebral hemispheres. So corticobulbar tract from right side and left side will be supplying the upper part of the facial nerve nucleus. Whereas the lower part of the facial nerve nucleus is receiving supply only from the contralateral side. Okay. It does not get a supply from the ipsilateral side. By which I mean, when there is a stroke and I'm showing you two sites of lesions, you look at A, and you look at B. Okay.
okay look at a and look at b when there is a lesion at a level okay there is a lesion there so which you know so the right umn facial palsy is happening because it is cortico bulba a while back i told you cortico bulbar affection is upper motor neuron so suppose there is an upper motor neuron affection there then you tell me out of the upper part and lower part which will be affected and which will be spared remember the upper part is having an additional supply from the ipsilateral side as well which means though this one is gone the ipsilateral side is perfectly normal no problem at all i will actually go with that i have no problem i don't want your support that is what the upper part will tell you but the lower part was entirely dependent on the other side in a right you know in a right sided involvement i'm this i'm not talking of a right umn facial palsy i'm talking of an involvement in the right side of the cortex okay right cortico bulbar tract lesion you tell me will it be a left umn facial palsy left lmn facial palsy right umn facial palsy or right lmn four options mcq tell me what is the answer so remember when there is a right cortico bulbar pathway lesion the left lower part of the facial muscles are getting affected left lower part of the facial muscles are getting affected so the left lower part they will not be able to move so patient will move deviation of angle of mouth to right side so what sort of facial palsy it is it is a left sided facial palsy it is a umn facial palsy or lmn facial palsy it is a umn facial palsy so the lesion a will produce a umn facial palsy let, let me just write with better clarity the lesion a will produce a left facial palsy which is of upper motor neuron type left umn facial palsy whereas the lesion b will produce a left lesion b means what the lesion is in the facial nerve so from the facial nerve nuclei you are having fibers which come down so when these fibers are getting affected or destroyed the entire face is affected because the upper part and lower part two facial nerve nuclei the facial nerve nuclei has two parts but these two fibers will join to form a single facial nerve so when there is a lesion affecting the facial nerve or the facial nerve nucleus either of this you will call it as a lmn facial palsy umn facial palsy means any lesion above the facial nerve nucleus lmn facial palsy means a lesion either at the facial nerve nucleus or the facial nerve so b is left lmn facial palsy left lmn facial palsy okay okay let me just ask you for a minute are you with me and did you understand okay if yes give me some happy smileys okay i just want to see you are all awake or not okay so yeah tell me tell me tell me everyone you have to stay and finish the class today even if you are feeling sleepy no don't go to bed finish it off okay yeah agree with me just waiting for your comments there will be small lag between this uh, youtube relay okay that's why i'm just waiting okay right so i've got a lot of smileys now okay fine so this is what is a lmn facial palsy okay so this analysis also you understood okay right now coming to the further discussion history of present illness wife then noticed that his speech became slurred and was not as legible as before there is no reduction of the word output during conversations however he was obeying all commands told to him that is the next part you tell me what is the impression there what is the impression from these symptoms how does a clinician think okay on hearing this how does he you know come to conclusions well this is a aphasia or a dysarthria you tell me is it aphasia or dysarthria you tell me aphasia or dysarthria 
Well, the analysis here is that of a probable or possible UMN or spastic dysarthria. Sir, what is this dysarthria, sir? I've never understood aphasia, dysarthria, always confusing, sir. How to identify from this? So, though in the examination part, I will be making some more points, that is in the next class. Here, I want you to have a look at some very important points. So, I'll just tell you about aphasia and dysarthria. First of all, I want your close attention for the next 10 to 15 minutes so that you finish your understanding of the topic now. Okay, right. Right. So all of you, uh, please be with me. The only problem is don't go to sleep. Problem is in case, you know, there is some relay problem, I'll have to continue in Zoom. So you might miss that uh, part of the lesson. So uh, please be attentive and finish it now. Okay. Right. Uh, so look at this. You're seeing the cerebral hemisphere. Okay. And I am marking certain important regions in that cerebral hemisphere. Not I am marking, it is already marked. Okay, certain important regions. Let us look what are these regions. Uh, primary motor cortex, arcuate fasciculus, Broca's area, primary auditory cortex, Wernick's area, angular gyrus, and primary visual cortex. Okay, primary visual cortex. So these are some important areas. I am going to tell you uh, some important points regarding this. Okay, now. I always start my class uh, about this uh, speech by telling you some examples. For example, I am showing you this pen. Now you tell me, what is this answer? What is this? What is this? You tell a full sentence, tell me. What is this? This is a pen. This is a pen. Now, uh, suppose if I ask you, how are you feeling today? Okay. And you're answering, sir, I'm feeling good today. Okay. Let's try to trace this pathway because this is very important to understand. See, I asked you some question. You understood or comprehended and you said that, sir, I'm doing fine today. I showed you an object. You saw this. You understood this object and you said this is a pen. How did this happen is what I'm going to teach you. See, when I first asked you, how are you doing today? I am asking you a sentence. So where should the impulses first go? It should go to your auditory cortex. Correct? Via the ear, it should go to the auditory cortex. Please understand, your auditory cortex does not hear as, uh, how are you doing today? It did not hear like that. What is sir telling here? Yes. See, the auditory cortex hears only certain syllables. Ha, ha, you, the, the, ha, ha, you, the, 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 the. The auditory cortex only hears certain syllables. Ha, ha, auditory cortex only heard certain syllables, which means coming to this pathway, this is the primary auditory cortex which heard only syllables. Sir, what are you saying then? Who understood this? Well, comprehension is a function of the vernix area. So from the auditory cortex, signals will go to the vernix area. So all the auditory cortex heard was certain syllables. Oh, oh, eh, de, today. The vernix area comprehended it. How are you doing today? Okay. It comprehended that. So that is a function of burning area. Now I understood, okay, how are you doing today is the question. Now I should tell back that, sir, I am doing fine today. How is that possible? Well, in your vocabulary, you have got certain words. True. But don't you think that you have got to string those syllables together and form a proper sentence? So this is a function of the Broca's area. So the Broca's area is very important for stringing the syllables together and making a sentence with a proper grammar. Okay. That is a function of Broca's area. 
Now the Broca Seria makes a beautiful sentence. Sir, I am doing fine today. Okay. Now the Broca Seria made that sentence, but don't you think the Broca Seria has got to speak? Correct. It has got to speak. So how does that happen? Well, from the Broca's area, meanwhile, one point, you know, you should understand is the Broca's area and Wernick's area, they are connected by means of a fasciculus. And what is that fasciculus known as? Arcuate fasciculus. Arcuate fasciculus. Arcuate fasciculus. So, and also from the Broca's area, signals are going to the motor cortex. See, you have got to speak. No, when you say, sir, I am doing fine. Your lung, your not lungs, your lips, uh, your tongue, uh, pharynx, larynx, they all are put into action, right? So for that, you need muscles. Muscles should be active. For muscles to be active, you have got to have an upper motor neuron going and supplying the muscles. No, it, I mean, synapsing with the lower motor neuron and lower motor neuron has to supply these muscles. So you've got to have a motor pathway, correct? No. So that is why it goes to motor cortex. So whatever sentence was formed by the Broca's area, if you want to properly bring it out or articulate, you need the motor cortex. Not just the motor cortex, the corticospinal and corticobulbar pathway, not just the corticospinal and corticobulbar pathway, even the lower motor neurons as well to bring about the articulation. Did you understand? Okay. This is what has to happen. Okay. And remember, all these key language areas are located in the dominant hemisphere. Don't you th don't think that there are two Broca's area, two Wernick's area. Remember, in the dominant hemisphere, you have got certain key language areas. You have got certain key language areas. Okay, so I'm happy to see even past midnight, we have got uh, over 1000 attendants. Okay, so uh, right, great. So key language areas are there in the dominant hemisphere. Now talking about dominant hemisphere, in a right-handed individual, remember 99 percentage cases, the left hemisphere is dominant, which, is me which means these language areas will be located in the left hemisphere. What about left-handed individuals? Even in left-handed individuals, 60% will have left hemisphere dominance. So even left-handed majority is left hemispheric dominance, but a higher proportion will have a right hemispheric dominance compared to right-handed individuals. Okay. So this dominance is meant by what? Where you have got these language areas. Okay. So these are certain key language areas. So one more point I want to tell you. So you understood. How, how are you doing today? I asked you. Auditory cortex. Uh, 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 the Wernick area. How are you doing today? Broca area. Formed a sentence. Ready. Who has to deliver? Who is the swiggy delivery boy? The corticospinal tract, and then he speaks out. If there is a lesion, you know, one more point I've got to mention. The next point I've got to mention is remember, I showed you this pen, and you said it is a pen. So basically, for that, first of all, via the visual pathway, the impulses will go to the primary visual cortex. Now, the primary visual cortex on seeing a pen did not understand it is a pen. This is very important. See, when you have got a, when I show you this, the primary visual cortex will only be able to identify the shape of object and the color of object, not the name of the object. My primary visual cortex knows this structure is used for writing, but my visual cortex, primary visual cortex does not know the name of the structure. So who knows the name of the structure? Who knows the name of the structure? Who knows the name of the structure? The angular gyrus is there. Okay. So you have got the angular gyrus. 
So this angular gyrus is the one that will help in naming. Okay. So naming of objects is a function of the angular gyrus. So I saw this pen. Visual cortex knows it is something for writing, not the exact name. Angular gyrus identified it is a pen. Then what happened is, uh, you know, the, um, the warning area also un understood the question that I asked you. What is this? That has to be there. No, he has got to comprehend it properly. Then the broadcast area will say, will string the syllables together. This is a pen and the delivery boy is the primary motor cortex. Okay. Now, what is the difference between aphasia and dysarthria? What is the difference between aphasia and dysarthria? Well, in strict terms, aphasia is a, aphasia occurs due to a lesion in the dominant hemisphere language areas. Dominant hemisphere language areas you get aphasia, okay? Whereas dysarthria is a defect in articulation. Defect in articulation is dysarthria. So you've got aphasia, you've got dysarthria. Articulation means what? Whatever was formed by the Broca, to have it properly delivered by the swiggy boys, corticospinal tract and the lower motor neurons, the swiggy boys are getting affected. That is what is a dysarthria, defect in the articulation. Whereas those language areas getting affected, it is aphasia. For example, if I get a lesion involving the vernix area, suppose there is a lesion involving the vernix area. Vernix area is Broadman area 22, located in the posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus. Okay. So that is where the lesion is of the vernix area. So when there is a vernix area lesion, when I ask you, how are you feeling today? Your auditory cortex hurt uh, 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 today, but the vernix area did not understand the question. So what will happen? I probably heard the question as, what did you have for breakfast? I will say, I had Italy for breakfast. This is why patients with vernix aphasia they reply in a nonsense manner. They are not replying to the question that is asked. Why? It's not their fault. They are not able to comprehend man. They should understand. No, you are asking some question. The vernix area is not properly comprehending. Auditory cortex only heard some syllables. So when it assembles in the vernix area, which is not properly assembled, it becomes another question. You are asking, uh, what did you have for breakfast? Suppose you ask, what did you have for breakfast? I heard it as, you know, when are you going to college today? And I might say something else. So that is what happens in a vernix aphasia or a sensory aphasia, where uh, aphasia, patient will be able to speak. Don't think that aphasia means patient is not able to speak. I'll tell you the exact definition of aphasia in a short while, but many students simply say in the exam that it is inability to speak. Do you think in the uh, vernix aphasia patient has any inability to speak? Absolutely not. He is able to speak, but the problem is in vernix aphasia, uh, the patient is having a fluent speech, which is why it is called a fluent aphasia, but it is a nonsense speech. So nonsense speech in that he is replying something else and not just that patient while he is speaking will have something known as neologism. Neologism. What is neologism? Neologism means, I'm just going to say a sentence with neologism. How was your dinner, Kiprant, today? How was your dinner, Kiprant, today? What, sir? How was your dinner, Kiprant, today? Kiprant. What is Kiprant? Kiprant. I don't think there is a word like that. I suppose there is no word like that. Okay. So, Kiprant. It's a new word, neologism, new word with no meaning, neologism, making new words. Patients with vernix aphasia simply make some new words as well. So the speech is fluent, telling some nonsense, adding some words like this. And this is known as a jargon aphasia, which is why patients will have all these jargon words. And it is known as a jargon aphasia. 
Okay, right. So that is very clear for you, right? So that is uh, Wernicke's surface here. Now, if you have got a lesion involving the Broca's area, suppose you have got a lesion involving the Broca's area. Well, in that case, the patient comprehended the question very well, but he is not able to string the syllables together. So the Broca's area, which is Broadman area 44, located in the posterior part of the inferior frontal gyrus is getting affected and there is a lesion there and the patient word output will be reduced. So what happens in a Broca surfacia is unlike the vernix where the word output was fluent, Broca area, Broca I told you is important for making a proper sentence and that too with grammar. So one is that the word output will be reduced because Broca is not functioning. And also there will be grammatical errors. There will be grammatical errors. There will be grammatical errors. Now, what do I mean by these grammatical errors? See, um, when I say, sir, I am feeling good today. Okay. Versus I good today. I good today. I good today. So the exact grammar is, the grammar is wrong here. So it is a grammatical error. So patients with broca aphasia don't think that broca aphasia always will not speak. Yes, sometimes patients with broca aphasia may not speak at all. Sometimes they will speak less with lesser word output and that too with grammatical errors. And since they have grammatical errors, sometimes they have a unique type of speech known as telegraphic speech. So what is telegraphic speech? I hope you have heard about telegram, not the telegram groups that uh, everyone has. Uh, telegram means, you know, in previous days, instead of letter, if you had something very urgent, you used to send a telegram. And in telegram, when you, nobody used to write long sentences in telegram because uh, uh, when you put sentences in telegram, you will cut short the number of words because each word, there is a cost while you do in telegram. So whoever is sending the telegram will try to keep it very crisp and short. So uh, remember the old movies where the, you know, the hero gets a telegram where it's written, father died, come immediately. Instead of writing, your father has expired yesterday morning. So it will be just father died, come immediately. So this is known as a telegraphic speech. Like in telegram, you're not following the strict grammar but that is called a telegraphic speech, which happens in a Broca's aphasia. Now, if there is a lesion involving the angular gyrus, suppose there is a lesion involving the angular gyrus. In that case, what is going to happen is the patient will have defect in the naming and word finding. So when I look at this pen in a patient with, uh, uh, okay, I'm just stopping the sharing. When I show you this pen, if you are having an, an anomic aphasia, which happens due to an angular gyrus lesion, you will see this and say, sir, this is that thing used for writing. You will write, no, in that, you, the one that you use for writing, you will not be able to say the word, this is a pen. Okay. So this is what happens in the aphasia known as anomic aphasia. In the aphasia known as anomic aphasia. Okay. Anomic aphasia which is also known as nominal aphasia. So anomic aphasia, which is also known as nominal aphasia. Anomic, also known as nominal aphasia. So there is a defect in the naming and word finding. So angular gyrus located in the parietal lobe is having a Broadman area 39. Okay. So these are the important key language areas. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so about some more points about aphasia, conduction aphasia, I'll tell you about the, when I discuss the examination part, but for the time being, you also know what is the definition of aphasia. So when in the exam, the practical exam in your exam, they often ask you definitions. So aphasia is defined as, please don't say it is the inability to speak. Okay. It is a loss or impairment in the production or comprehension because Broca's area is a problem with production. 
production or comprehension of written or spoken language due to an acquired lesion in the brain. This is what is an aphasia. Whereas dysarthria means it is a defective articulation of syllables. Okay. So aphasia has to be an acquired lesion. Someone who is not able to speak since birth is not having aphasia. It has to be a acquired lesion in the brain that produces this deficit that is aphasia. Dysarthria is a defective articulation of syllables. Understood. Now, coming to this patient. So here the speech was slurred. Okay, speech was slurred and was not legible as before. So there is no reduction in the word output during a conversation. So you tell me, can this be a Broca's aphasia? No, not possible. However, he was obeying all commands told to him. Can it be a Wernick's aphasia? No, not possible. My dear students, you tell me, what is the language abnormality in this patient? Is it aphasia or dysarthria? You tell me, what is the language abnormality in this patient? Aphasia or dysarthria? Okay, aphasia or dysarthria. What is the language abnormality here? This is a dysarthria. Because why it is a dysarthria? I will be able to say with total conviction only after examination. But from the history, it looks like this is a dysarthria. From the history, this looks like this is a dysarthria. Which is why I said, possibly a dysarthria and what sort of a dysarthria? UM and dysarthria or spastic dysarthria. Sir, what is this, sir? UM and dysarthria, what is that? Well, there are different types of dysarthria. So you have got the upper motor neuron dysarthria or the spastic dysarthria, flaccid dysarthria or the element dysarthria, cerebellar dysarthria, hyperkinetic dysarthria, hypokinetic dysarthria and Mixed dysarthria. My dear students, are you all with me? If you feel sleepy, you know, just have a cup of uh, water or uh, tea, coffee, whatever you have there. So, uh, type of dysarthria, right? So, these are the type of dysarthria. Let me tell you about these types. First of all, spastic dysarthria. So, what is a spastic dysarthria? Spastic dysarthria or UM and dysarthria means. In this sort of dysarthria, there is an increased effort and the patients are having syllables running into one another. Okay, So it will be like a hot potato voice. I know that at least some of you will raise eyebrows, especially good in ENT. Maybe you learned in Quincy or something about the hot potato voice. Even in medicine, in case of a spastic dysarthria, Patient will have increased effort, increased strain, and when they speak, you know, syllables will run into one another. For example, my name is Rahul. My name is Rahul. I did not say my name is Rahul. I said my name is Rahul. Rahul, 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 Rahul. It's not Rahul. They say Rahul. Rahul. So it's like syllables are running into one another. This is a spastic dysarthria, as if there is a hot potato in the mouth. Then you have got the flaccid dysarthria. So when you talk about flaccid or element dysarthria, this can be further subdivided. Further subdivided into labial dysarthria, lingual dysarthria and guttural dysarthria. What is labial? Labial means lip. You guys tell, tell along with me. Ma, pa, pa, ma, pa, ma, pa, ma, pa. You are using your lips. So these are labials. So an element dysarthria where predominantly labial syllables are affected is called a labial flaccid dysarthria. Linguals, you try saying ta, la, ta, 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 la, ta, ta, la, ta. So this is involving the tongue. So this is lingual. Dysarthria where predominantly linguals are affected is a lingual dysarthria. Gutturals, ga, 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 ga. Sometimes patients with bulbar muscle weakness, when they say ga, it will be like nga, nga, nga. Those students who are following my WhatsApp groups will know that uh, uh, 
when I teach, uh, I show one video of my patient with myasthenia gravis. So having a bulbar myasthenia gravis, I have shown that video as well. When he speaks, he says na 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 na. He is asked to say ga. So this is actually a nasal quality of voice that happens in a guttural dysarthria. These are the types of flaccid dysarthria. Then you get ataxic dysarthria. So ataxic dysarthria happens in cerebellar lesions where you have got scanning speech and staccato speech. Scanning means there is an undue separation of syllables. My name is Rahul. Undue separation of syllables. This is a scanning speech. Scanning speech. Staccato speech means there is undue stress on syllables. My name is Rahul. My name is Rahul. My name is Rahul. Nay, nay, nay. So certain syllables are being stressed too much. This is known as a staccato speech. So scanning speech and staccato speech, they are classically seen in what? Cerebellar lesions. Will all patients have this type of speech in cerebellar lesions? Need not be. Some patients may have scanning. Some patients may have staccato. Some may, may not have either of this. Okay. Right. So when I teach you about that cerebellar case taking, I'll be teaching you about which area of the cerebellum is important in speech and all. You have got hypokinetic dysarthria where there is a reduced loudness and a mono pitch, which means single pitch. Which condition? Parkinson's disease. Patients with Parkinson's disease have a very monotonous speech. Maybe, you know, have you heard of such lectures as well? Okay. Hypokinetic, reduced loudness, mono pitch. You feel like sleeping. I hope my class is not a hypokinetic dysarthria type of class. Okay. Hyperkinetic dysarthria means there will be variable rate. At some places, there will be increased loudness and increased speed. Certain places, it will be dramatically reduced. Inappropriate silence. So another chaotic type of dysarthria is a hyperkinetic dysarthria, which is seen in a Huntington disease. HD. At your level, you need not, they might not ask you too much about this, but they might ask you what are the types of disarthria. Okay, right. And finally, you may have a mixed disarthria. For students who are listening, sir, you are teaching so much. No, my dear students, as I said, this is just one class that you need to listen. One class of history taking, make good notes, it's done. There is no need to read any other point. Okay, just for history, just follow this alone. Okay, examination, next class. So we have analyzed this. So this is possibly a UMN dysarthria. How did I understand it is a UMN dysarthria? You tell me, I'm asking you in the chat box. How did I understand it is a UMN dysarthria? Okay, UMN dysarthria. Why not? Because all it is given is legible. Are you a magician to understand this is a uh, UMN dysarthria, you, you, you tell me, how did you understand? You tell me. Well, there is a problem here. See, about this dysarthria, there is a dysarthria, that is what I understood. But tell me, what is the type of weakness this patient is having? UMN weakness or LMN weakness? UMN weakness. Okay. Next, is the patient having a UMN facial palsy or LMN facial palsy? UMN facial palsy. In that case, you tell me what should be the type of dysarthria, UMN or LMN. It should be UMN because patient is having a UMN lesion. I already understood. So this dysarthria is possibly a UMN dysarthria. So there is something that is known as Occam's razor. Have you heard it? Occam's razor, which means in clinical medicine, Always try to explain by the minimum number of lesions. You can argue with me, sir, why, what if there are two stroke or two lesions? One UMN, one element. Possible, very well possible. But common logic says you are more likely to get lesser number of lesions, right? So Occam's razor means you try to explain a scenario by making minimum number of assumptions. Means there is only one lesion. 
or I can say, sir, what if there is one lesion there and another separate lesion here? Possible. But Occam's razor, that's common sense. Okay. So that is uh, UMN disarray. Right. Now, coming to the remaining part of the history. Okay. No sensory symptoms. Is that important? It is important. My dear students, you should know that just like as I discussed about the descending pathways, there are certain ascending pathways as well. So these ascending pathways are mainly the sensory pathways. So what are the two important ascending sensory pathways? You have got the spinothalamic tract. You have got the spinothalamic tract. And also you have got the dorsal column pathway. You've got the dorsal column pathway. These are two sensory ascending tracks. You know that spinothalamic will cross at the level of spinal cord. Okay, it will cross at the level of spinal cord and then it will ascend, ascend, it will go to the thalamus. So the first order neuron is in the dorsal root ganglion. Second order neuron is in the SGR, Substantia Gelatinosa of Orlando, giving you deja vu of your first year MBBS. So second year, second order neurons are ascending. Always remember, second order neurons are the ones which crosses. Keep it for life. Second order neurons always will cross. They will cross and they will ascend, will reach the thalamus. From thalamus, you get third order neurons which supply the cortex. This will be precentral gyrus or postcentral gyrus. Sensory cortex is in the precentral gyrus or postcentral gyrus. You tell me. Precentral gyrus or postcentral gyrus. It is in the postcentral gyrus. Okay. Whereas the dorsal column pathway will not cross in the spinal cord. First order neuron is from the dorsal root ganglion, but it will keep ascending. It will reach the medulla. It is in the medulla. They will make the next synapse and form the second order neuron, which then crosses. I told you who crosses always second order neurons, then ascends, reaches the thalamus and then again supplies the sensory cortex. Okay. That is the dorsal column pathway. Similar to that, you also remember we discussed about spinothalamic tract and dorsal column pathway, which are carrying sensations from one side of the body. Right. So once there are two on each side, right, one on each side, one side of the body. Okay. Now, uh, what happens is there is also another tract known as trigeminothalamic tract. Trigeminothalamic tract. My dear students, you tell me your facial sensations while you are attending my class. Just have a, just touch your cheek. These sensations are carried by, is it the spinothalamic tract? No, it is not spinothalamic tract. There is another tract known as the trigeminothalamic tract. So trigeminothalamic tract means from the, you know, you have heard about the V1, V2 and V3 divisions of the trigeminal nerve, which are the ophthalmic, maxillary and mandibular divisions. So these divisions will take the supply. Remember it is sensory. So afferent impulses will go, it will go to the trigeminal ganglion and then will go to the trigeminal nucleus. How many trigeminal nucleus you have? Well, you have got three main trigeminal nucleus, three predominant ones. One is in the mesencephalic nucleus in the midbrain. Then you have got the principal sensory nucleus in the pons. And also you have got the spinal nucleus of the trigeminal nerve which is a very long nucleus having a very long extent. In fact, from the lower part of pons, it extends up to the C1 and C2 cervical spinal segments. So it's a long extending nucleus. So the V1, V2 and V3 divisions will go to the trigeminal ganglion and from the trigeminal ganglion, it will go to the, uh, the trigeminal nucleus. Now you can see that here again, please look at this pathway, this trigeminothalamic and from the nucleus, you will have the trigeminothalamic tract. So from this principal sensory nucleus, 
comes this tract known as the trigeminothalamic tract, trigeminothalamic tract, which will cross and then ascend to the thalamus. And from there, it will go on to the cortex. Okay. From there, it will go on to the cortex. So that is the trigeminothalamic tract. So my dear students, just like in case of a stroke, you can have motor pathways getting affected. You can even have sensory pathways getting affected. So suppose you have got a stroke involving these fibers. Okay. Stroke involving these fibers. Definitely, you know, you can have sensory affection as well. So, which all sensations, what are the superficial sensations, deep sensations, cortical sensations, that I will be teaching you when I teach you the examination part. For the time being, patient is not having any sensory symptoms. Okay. There is no sensory symptoms. No history suggestive of other cranial nerve involvement. Why did I say other cranial nerve involvement? Because seventh nerve, I have already told you. Now, what is so unique about seventh nerve? Please remember, see, in a stroke, usually, if it is a cortical stroke, corticobulbar fibers, I'm not talking of brainstem stroke. When there is a stroke which is affecting the corticobulbar fibers, usually the cranial nerve is not affected. Because, see, remember when I taught you about the facial nucleus, when I taught you about the facial nucleus, okay, uh, I told you about the bilateral innervation. And the lower part is only having contralateral innervation. Remember, all cranial nerve nuclei, whether it be upper part or lower part, will get bilateral innervation. I once again repeat, all cranial nerve nuclei on each side will get a corticobulbar innervation from both sides. So when you get a stroke that involves the corticobulbar pathway, the other cranial nerves will not get affected. And that is why only the facial nerve is affected. But if you want to know some more detail, you've heard about the genioglossus muscle. Yes, which is the muscle, which is the nerve that supplies hypoglossal nerve. So the part of the hypoglossal nucleus that supplies the genioglossus muscle the part of the hypoglossal nucleus that supplies the genioglossus muscle, that part also only gets contralateral innervation. Even if you don't remember that, it is okay. But seventh is very important. Okay, seventh and this small part of this twelfth that is unique in that it is receiving corticobulbar fibers only from opposite side, that is the lower part of facial. Okay, so why is it important to ask about? Any history suggestive of other cranial nerve involvement? The reason is very simple. I want to see if there is involvement of the brainstem. Okay, I want to see if there is involvement of the brainstem. Because we already learned that in brainstem, you have got different, different cranial nerve nuclei, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So if there are symptoms suggestive of any cranial nerve involvement, it is probably giving me a hint that I am probably thinking of a brainstem stroke. Okay, brainstem stroke. One and two is located at a different location. That is why I'm just talking of the other cranial nerves. And not just that, you have also taken into consideration the visual symptoms. Why is it important? Because, see, uh, visual symptoms also should be asked for. I did not specifically ask this because Already it is coming under the cranial nerve involvement. The optic nerve is a visual nerve. So what is the importance of these visual symptoms is that when you trace the visual pathway, when you trace the visual pathway, you must understand that, uh, yes, from the visual field, the impulses are falling into the retina. From there, you get these uh, optic nerve, optic chiasma, optic tract, and then this important structure that is known as the lateral geniculate body or LGB. And from LGB, you get the optic tract, optic radiation. You get the optic radiation. So please remember, the optic radiation also goes through the internal capsule. You tell me. I'm just waiting just to see if how many of you are awake. Which part of the internal capsule does optic radiation go through? 
which part of the internal capsule does it go through? Is it anterior limb, genu, posterior limb, retrolentiform part or the sublentiform part? You tell me. Well, yes, as you rightly said, it is the retrolentiform part. Retrolentiform part will have optic radiations. So when you get an internal capsule lesion, suppose if it is a stroke, don't you think sometimes you can have affection of the optic radiation? Which is why some patients may have homonymous hemianopia in stroke. Because the optic radiation is affected, you have already learned that optic radiation affection will produce a homonymous hemianopia. Right. So that is the importance. Yeah. Once again, another picture. This is the thalamus. And you know, it is a lateral geniculate body is a part of it. And what are these structures? Optic radiations. So in stroke, when the optic radiations are getting involved, heard about the Mayer's loop and all in ophthalmology. Mayer's loop. Heard about it. So what all happens um, in the lesion that I'll be discussing in the examination. For the time being, you understand that why you are asking. Because see, when you learn medicine, you have to know why. You will simply mug up certain negative history. Examiner will ask you why you are asking. You will say, just for a flow, I said, you know, some negative history. You must know what each negative history stands for. Once again, this picture uh, is just to tell you that uh, your brainstem is a highway. It's just to tell you that brainstem is a highway. So in a highway, you have got uh, vehicles moving in either direction. Similarly, you have got ascending pathways, descending pathways. So either side of the highway, you have got certain shops. And these shops in a brainstem are the cranial nerve nuclei. There are different shops at different locations. 3, 4 in the midbrain, 5, 6, 7, 8 in the pons. Yes, I agree, some are at the pontomedullary junction, but roughly 5, 6, 7, 8 at the pons. And 9, 10, 11, 12 at the medulla. Okay, so it's such a busy highway with so many ascending tracks and so many descending tracks. Okay, so it's important to ask for any visual symptoms, uh, cranial nerve symptoms, all are important. Then there is no history suggestive of any headache, vomiting, seizures. Why is it important? Headache, vomiting, seizures. See, Headache and vomiting is important because, not the seizure part, headache and vomiting, seizure is also important. Headache and vomiting is important because, you tell me why, to see it is the, whether there is any feature of raised intracranial tension. I agree that there are other features like hypertension, bradycardia, but that is the examination. No, from history, if the patient is having headache and vomiting, it is probably indicating that there is a raised intracranial tension. Now, what is the importance of asking history of seizures? So, seizures in a stroke, suppose if it is a stroke case, seizures in stroke are seen in what sort of stroke? Embolic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke? What do you think? What sort of stroke you will have seizures? Remember, seizure at the onset. If you get a seizure at the onset of stroke, that is the time there is a stroke, the patient is having a seizure. This is likely to be embolic. Don't get surprised. Don't have eyebrows. I know that, you know, you don't have, don't raise your eyebrows because I know some of you might be thinking, sir, hemorrhagic stroke, no seizures. Well, I agree. Later part of the stroke, later part doesn't mean many years later, but later part of the stroke, if patient is having, suppose you had a weakness, after three or four hours, patient is having a stroke. It is likely to be hemorrhagic. But if at the onset of stroke, it is there, it is uh, uh, embolic. Okay, right. So this is also important. No vertigo. Why is it important? It is also important because to see if there is any vestibular involvement. If there is any vestibular involvement. because in your brainstem, you have got location of the vestibular nuclei. In the medulla, you have got vestibular nuclei. So 
when the vestibular nuclei is affected, for example, in lateral medullary syndrome, you can have involvement. So you ask, is there any vertigo or not? Okay, so that is the importance of vertigo. No bladder symptoms, no bladder symptoms. So bladder getting involved in stroke is relatively less common. Why it is less common? Because the bladder is having bilateral innervation. I know that in your physiology lessons, you have learned about the bladder. At that time, you learned about the bladder reflex arc. But at that time, the emphasis was most on the sympathetic and the parasympathetic contributions. The sympathetic from the T11, T12, L1 and L2 segments. And sympathetic is the nerve which helps in storage of urine. So sympathetic helps in storage of urine. How? It will relax the detressor muscles and will contract the urethral sphincter. Okay. Internal urethral sphincter. Whereas the parasympathetic is often known as the nerve of urination, which will help in contracting the detressor muscle and relaxing the sphincter. This is known as parasympathetic supply to the bladder. So I'm sure you would have heard about this. But remember, it's not just about sympathetic and parasympathetic. Even up above, Uparwala is also there for this. So in the pons, you have got an important center for the micturition, which is known as Barrington nucleus. In the pons, you have an important center for micturition, which is known as the Barrington nucleus. And not just pons, even above, upper say upper, you have got some other structure. And what is that structure? You have got something that is known as the paracentral lobule. So you have got in your cerebral cortex a structure known as paracentral lobule, which is mainly located in the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere. I will just show you. It is located, just I'll highlight, somewhere here is the location of the paracentral lobule. So when the paracentral lobule is affected, yes, you may have a bladder affection. But remember, when one paracentral lobule is affected, many a times patient does not have symptoms. Why? Because the bladder has got two supports, one from the right paracentral lobule, other from the left paracentral lobule. So usually, bladder symptoms do not happen in stroke. But you might ask me, sir, no, no, no. I have seen in my ward postings Patients having catheter, stroke patients having catheter. Well, they are because of different reasons. One patient is not able to walk, so you need to put a urinary catheter. Somebody with a hemiplegia cannot walk to the toilet, so you've got to put a catheter in that patient, number one. Number two, there is a possibility of, uh, normally it is the anterior cerebral artery that supplies the uh, paracentral lobule. You know, I'm just drawing the anterior cerebral artery, which has a course like this. It goes like this, winds around. Okay, So it is the anterior cerebral artery which supplies the region of paracentral lobule. There is sometimes, normally you have got two anterior cerebral arteries and communicating between them, there is an anterior communicating artery which is known as the aqua. Sometimes instead of two anterior cerebral arteries, you will have a single or unpaired anterior cerebral artery. You will get something known as unpaired anterior cerebral artery unpaired anterior cerebral artery unpaired anterior cerebral artery so this unpaired anterior cerebral artery if there is a stroke involving unpaired anterior cerebral artery i've got cases see unpaired anterior cerebral artery means see all of you attending the class now some of you will normally have this anatomical variant known as unpaired acl some of you will have this anatomical variant don't think that everyone has the beautiful circle of willis, everything exactly like in your anatomy, Grace anatomy textbook. There are anatomical variants. So in those patients who are having an unpaired anterior cerebral artery, if there is a stroke involving that vessels, both the paracentral lobules will be affected and you can have bladder symptoms. Patient will have urinary incontinence. 
So if the examiner is asking you, uh, what are the possibilities? Yes, there is an unpaired ACA, you can have bladder symptoms. The next possibility is, suppose if I had a stroke a few years back, at that time, my left paracenter lobule is gone. Khatam, gone, tata, bye-bye. At the same time, now, if you have got the right paracenter lobule getting affected, tuck. Now both are affected. So a previous stroke involving the other paracenter lobule and now a fresh stroke, in that case also patient may have a bladder symptoms. So I hope you understood what is the importance of asking about the bladder symptoms. Okay, bladder symptoms. Okay, now, see what I want you to understand, you know, is um, when you learn for your exams, if you learn one proper history, the advantage is when you go to the exam, you, you already have a history in your mind. You have to just make some modifications. Do not think that you go to the practical exam and then you start asking the patient. You know, you sit in a chair. Yes, what is your problem? You ask in detail. Then you think, okay, how shall I frame the sentence? Nothing like that. You don't get time for that. You already have a preset history in your mind. Make certain corrections according to the history and then put it. Otherwise, you will not be able to finish. You will take five or six hours. Exam will be over. Okay. You have to finish in a short duration time. No. So this is why I am giving all my dear students a preset case so that you can make your own modifications in the case that you get. Bladder symptoms are clear. Okay. And another importance of bladder symptom is sometimes, you know, patients with stroke, they may get some urinary tract infections, correct? Stroke patients, bedridden patients, chance of urinary tract infections. So that also is important when you ask the history, bladder symptom. Next, why do you ask for chest pain or palpitations? See, suppose if in this case, though there is no chest pain or palpitations, suppose if the patient had a chest pain or palpitation, Prior to the weakness, what is the possibility? See, remember, in case we are dealing with a stroke, it is very important to ask about chest pain palpitations because this will tell us whether the stroke is cardioembolic in origin. So if there is an embolus, so suppose if patient is having a myocardial infarction, patient having a myocardial infarction. In that case, if the patient is having a myocardial infarction, what about the contractility of the myocardium? Normal or decreased? Definitely decreased. Okay, definitely decreased. Okay, so one second, there is one doubt. Fatima is asking, does seizure show a lesion in the cortex? Well, Fatima, you are right. Seizure mainly means it is a lesion in the cortex. Seizure means it is a lesion in the cortex. Let me give you, Fatima, one more importance of asking history of seizures. Sometimes patients with unilateral seizures, after some time, you know, after the seizures, they may get a transient weakness. And what is the name of this transient weakness? Torch paralysis. Torch paralysis or torch palsy. So, Fatima, this torch palsy is a stroke mimic. Sometimes patient might come to the emergency department. Sometimes, you know, he's not talking much. You look, there is a weakness of one limb. You feel this is a stroke. But on careful history taking, they say that there was some seizure before that. So, actually, it was a torch palsy. Okay. So, that is also one importance. I agree with you, Fatima. Seizure means it is suggesting cortex. Aphasia. That also means it is a cortex. Aphasia is cortex, but actually there is a subcortical aphasia as well. But for MBBS students, just know that it is mainly cortex. There is an entity known as subcortical aphasia. So once you get into MD medicine, if any of my dear students uh, love to take medicine, I would request you to come back to me after taking medicine so that I will teach you at that time about uh, subcortical aphasia. So there is a subcortical aphasia as well. Okay. So chest pain palpitation is to see if there is a cardioembolic origin because if there is a myocardial infarction, the contractility will be affected. So when the myocardial contractility is decreased, what is happening? There is a chance of clot formation. And what is this 
what is the reason for this? I am sure you would have heard of the Virchow's triad. Heard of this, no? Virchow's triad, where you can have a clot that is being formed. What are the predisposing conditions leading to a thrombus? Either an endothelial injury. Guys, tell me what are the components? Endothelial injury or you can get a stasis or turbulence of blood flow. Stasis or turbulence of blood flow. What is the third one? You tell me endothelial injury, stasis or turbulence of blood flow. Hyper coagulability. Okay. So when any of these state is there, there is a chance of increased clot formation. Okay. So endothelial injury, stasis or turbulence or there is hypercoagulability of the blood. So in that case, clot will be formed, which is the Virchow's triad. So in myocardial infarction, there is a chance of the clot being formed. Similarly, palpitations are also important to see if there are any arrhythmias. For example, if the patient is having a atrial fibrillation, AF, don't you think this patient is also having a chance of cardioembolic stroke? which is why you have to ask about history of palpitations. Okay, right. Next is no loss of consciousness or impairment in consciousness. So if it is a large stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, so the point here is large strokes, even ischemic strokes, large ischemic strokes, large ischemic strokes, and also hemorrhagic strokes, these will cause impairment in consciousness mainly because of affection of the reticular activating system. So when there is a reticular activating system, though this reticular activating system is present in the brainstem, it is having connections with the thalamus and also the cortex. So if there is a reticular activating system, being affected, then you can have an impairment in the consciousness. You can also have an impairment in the consciousness if an arrhythmia is leading on to a stroke because arrhythmia will produce a transient hypoperfusion of the brain leading on to loss of consciousness. Arrhythmia will also result in a blood clot being formed. Okay. And then that can actually result in a stroke as well. Okay. So, so that is the importance of asking about loss of consciousness. Okay. So I hope you understood regarding that. Then the remaining part of the history, no fever, night sweats, weight loss. See, what is the importance of this? See, don't think that hemiplegia equivalent to stroke. Many students think, okay, all cases of hemiplegia is stroke. See, can't you have a tuberculoma? Heard of tuberculoma? Heard of tuberculoma? In central nervous system tuberculosis, you can have tuberculomas in the brain and that can lead on to weakness sometimes. So not just tuberculomas, cryptococcosis, so neurocysticercosis, all these neuro infections can produce, can mimic stroke. So it is important to take history suggestive of any neuro infection. Okay, is there any history suggestive of a neuro infection? So that history has to be taken. So fever, night sweats, weight loss, everything very, very important. Okay, fever, night sweats, weight loss, everything very important. And suppose if a patient is having a prolonged fever and then a stroke, prolonged fever, for example, one month fever and then stroke, what possibility you are thinking? I'm just giving you time to answer. Let me see if anyone answers this. Meanwhile, I'm going to the next point, waiting for your answers. There is no cough or hemoptysis. What is the importance of this? The importance is, as I told you, hemiplegia is not always due to stroke alone. I have had a patient who presented with an acute onset weakness, which was actually a case of carcinoma lung with brain metastasis. It was not a stroke. It was a lung carcinoma with brain metastasis, but had an acute presentation. So this is a, to rule out a CA lung. 
and obviously even tuberculosis as well. But CA lung with metastasis, CA lung with METS is a stroke mimic. CA lung with METS is a stroke mimic. Is a stroke mimic. Right. Now, why do I ask history of breathlessness? When any patient develops a stroke and it be becomes quickly bedridden, don't you think there is always a chance of aspiration pneumonia? Don't you think there is always a chance of aspiration pneumonia? So any stroke patient who is having a tachypnea, don't you think you have to see the possibility of a aspiration pneumonia? Correct? No? Important. Then um, you have to ask history of any bed source. Why? Because see, in this case, only one day is over. So no chance of any bed sore. I agree. But it is important to ask in a stroke, in a hemiplegia case. See, when the patient is there for some time, there may be a chance of bed sore. Suppose, you know, the case you are getting in your exam is a patient who has been admitted for three weeks in the ward. He might have developed a bed sore. You should not miss it. You ask, you know, whether there is some skin peeling or some ulcer in your back, uh, you know, especially in the sacral region. So there is a chance of bed sore. Okay. So that is why whether there is any bed sore, which are known as pressure sores. So at your heels, okay, at the heel region and all pressure sores. So the patient was brought to the hospital within nine hours of onset of symptoms. You tell me, why is it important to mention this? Is there any relevance or no? Is there any relevance or no? Meanwhile, I am coming to one question which is beautifully answered by Nuza. Prolonged fever. Very good. Very good. Infective endocarditis. Don't you think there is a chance of embolization for a prolonged fever is important or not? So infective endocarditis can produce stroke. Correct? That is the importance of prolonged fever. So what is the importance of duration of symptoms? Who is going to tell me? Who is going to tell me? What is the importance of duration of symptoms? Because in stroke, I want to see if the patient is a candidate for revascularization or not. Because you know that in the management of acute ischemic stroke, there are two revascularization modalities. One is a IV thrombolysis and the second one is a mechanical thrombectomy which I have taught you in detail in my lectures as well with figures. So these are the revascularization modalities. IV thrombolysis can be done up to 4.5 hours. Mechanical thrombectomy can be done up to 6 hours. So IV thrombolysis within 4.5 hours of onset of symptoms and mechanical thrombectomy within six hours of onset of symptoms, right? So mechanical thrombectomy in some circumstances, you can do beyond six hours as well, but at your level, six hours, okay? Now, so if the patient comes early, he is a candidate. If he comes out of the window period, the only option is prophylaxis, secondary prophylaxis with aspirin. Remember, aspirin is given in a stroke patient not to treat the stroke. It is to prevent a recurrent stroke. Okay, so what can remove the current blood clot is these two revascularization modalities. And you are examining the patient after one day. So this is also important. See, you are examining the patient after five days. You are asking the history and all till the patient came. Don't you want to know in these five days, has there been any weakness? Otherwise, when you present to the examiner, you might say that there is severe weakness. Now patient is having improved. You can say that, sir, last four days is how, you know, his weakness has been improving. So that point also is important as a conclusion statement. No further progression or improvement of disability over the past one day. Got it? This is how you press it. Now I know that many students like to get simple capsule tips. Well, uh, in my class also you will get it, but that will not be the only thing that you get. Because I am not someone who favors students mugging up. So we all are medical professionals and we have to have a, a decent quality. So when you pass your final MBBS practical exam, it's not about the mark you get. 
even if that practical exam day was tough for you, you got a tough case, that is possible. Luck is also important. But when you pass, you have to have a confidence. You know, you look at the mirror and say, I did something good over the last few months. I learned so many things. Though the exam was not so great, I feel good to be a doctor. That is very important. Don't think mugging up certain things and uh, vomiting in the exam is uh, just about getting knowledge. No, you have to not cheat yourself. Just ask yourself, did you know why you asked each question? What is the importance of each question? How you come to conclusions? This is how you have to come to conclusions. If you do not know this, you will just simply mug up a list of negative history and tell it without even knowing why you asked it. Okay, now for my dear students who want a checklist, means what? You are entering the medicine case presentation hall and they are having a case. You don't want to forget. I listed a list of symptoms, correct? You don't want to forget because sometimes you know what happens. Oh, I forgot to ask about sensory symptoms. I forgot to ask about cranial nerve symptoms. Oh, I forgot cerebellar symptoms. To avoid all this, this is my checklist. You either, you know, keep in your mind or, you know, you can have a small, you know, paper with you as well. I don't mind as an examiner. Okay. I'm not a very strict examiner. I always want my students to feel comfortable because uh, uh, even I feel uh, putting students under too much of stress is not good you know, for these practical exams, giving a random case suddenly, asking to diagnose this. Uh, it's not easy, even for the examiner. You just do one thing, you know, to the same examiner who's taking your case, the case that he doesn't know, just call the examiner and say, I'll give you 45 minutes, just examine the case and tell me what is the final diagnosis. He won't feel, the, you know, so happy because sometimes it is not possible. Okay, so it's okay. But uh, what I want you to understand is you try your best. Uh, you learn things like as I taught you and uh, it will definitely help you. You will feel better. That's what I want to tell you. You will feel better when you go to the exam hall. You know that you have got some substance. Okay. So whatever the examiner tries to do, you know that you will pass even before going to the exam hall. So checklist of symptoms. Do not forget, my dear children, about asking motor symptoms, sensory symptoms. These are all what I asked. Speech, cranial nerve symptoms, bladder symptoms, cerebellar symptoms. Now you tell me why did not I ask about unsteadiness while walking in this patient? Cerebellar is attacks here. No, you tell me. I'm just waiting for your comments. Why I did not mention about attacks here in this patient? You tell me. Cerebellar symptoms, vestibular symptoms you have got to ask. Features of raised intracranial tension. Are there any cardiac symptoms, respiratory symptoms suggestive of aspiration pneumonia? Is there any fever, either a new onset fever due to aspiration pneumonia or a prolonged fever suggestive of an infective endocarditis? Is there any complication? Like I just told you, aspiration pneumonia, UTI, bed sore and rule out stroke mimics. That is why you ask for cough, hemoptysis, uh, neuro infections, all this is important. Okay, right. Now you tell me why I asked about cerebellar. Yeah, see, this patient of ours cannot walk. He can only walk with two person support. So how can I test, you know, ask him, are you able to have unsteadiness? He will say, yes, I am not able to walk. So remember, to test or to ask in history properly about unsteadiness, you have to have a good power. Okay. So only then, you know, you have got, you can test no unsteadiness. Examination is testing, testing is in the examination part, but even history wise to ask the patient, have some common logic. Someone who is not able to walk, how will you ask a history of unsteadiness? So that is very important. You have to think as a proper clinician. Patient is not walking and what relevance is there, you know, asking a history, whether the patient is having unsteadiness. He will be having unsteadiness. He already requires two person support to walk. This is the checklist. Okay. Now, that is it. Now, coming to history of past illness. Now, uh, just tell me, till now, are you feeling good? Are you feeling good? We have finished the history. We are going to past illness. Are you feeling good? Just give me a smiley. Okay, just give me a smiley in the chat box. <clears throat> okay. If you are feeling sleepy, just have a one glass of water. That's it. Okay. Right. 
Right, right. So let's go to the uh, history of past illness. So he has type 2 diabetes for the past 12 years and is on insulin. Most of the recent blood sugar values are about 250 milligram percentage. See, what is the importance of this? When you ask past illness, it's important to ask about past medical comorbidities. So, yeah, happy to see a lot of smileys. And uh, we are past 1 a.m. And I'm very happy to see these many students live uh, even at this time. Amazing. Okay, right. So, um, the patient is on insulin. Now, as a doctor, you must ask the patient something to understand his glycemic status. See, the patient may or may not have brought the old investigation results, but you can just ask, no, in the last investigations that you have done, what were the values? Patient will say, sir, whatever I remember, everything was above 250. Educated patients definitely will remember that. So there is nothing wrong in writing there. Because what information does this give the examiner? You tell me. What is the importance of the second line? What is the importance of the second line? The importance of the second line is that the diabetes is uncontrolled. The diabetes is uncontrolled. And he is having a systemic hypertension for 10 years and is on medication. There is no history suggestive of coronary artery disease, thyroid disease or bronchial asthma. No history of any previous surgeries. These are the past illnesses. Okay. So this one is telling you that this is a uncontrolled type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uncontrolled type 2 diabetes mellitus. I can write short forms, but you cannot write. Why? I have passed. You have not. Okay. Just <laughs> write. You know, that's what happens. Even the same examiners who actually teach you in the exam, why are you writing short forms? They also use short forms only. But you know, there is a particular type of pleasure that any examiner will get, you know, while they try to frustrate or uh, these uh, MBBS students, you know, just try to get some pleasure. Uh, it's some sort of a, a strange pleasure they get. Um, I am not a big fan of it because they are junior colleagues. You ask them, you try to assess them what they know, but please don't demoralize them. They are budding doctors and the next time I should also understand that uh, when I have a chest pain, when I go to hospital, I will be praying that uh, it's a someone whom I know, maybe my student or a colleague or a senior, someone is there, I'll be praying. So that's it. You know, let's all be uh, courteous to our colleagues and never try to boss them too much. Okay. Right. Even in an exam, you know, like um, see, it's just that they are coming to an exam. No, it's, they're asked to diagnose something. Let's be kind to them and um, let them try to answer. You give a few hints, motivate them to answer so that even after the exam, they will enjoy the learning. The problem is if you give them a traumatizing experience in the exam hall, they will hate the subject. So if you just want to insult an MBBS student, I don't feel because see the trauma that he receives from that exam hall, he might carry that forward. Why do you want to disturb his peace? Uh, you know, let's otherwise you can tell him, you know, you are not thorough with the basics. Please go back and learn. So that is my policy. Right. And drug history, uh, drug history, you can either write along with this past history. Some examiners might favor that. You can even write separately as well. You might ask me, sir, how do you write drug history? We are taking history. No. See, some patients know the drug they are taking. If they know it, there is no problem in writing. You ask the patient. You are not supposed to check the list of the medications they are having. You cannot do that. But if the patient is able to remember and he tells that, you know, I was on human mixed art, 30, 70, 28 in the morning, 24 in the night, 20, 28 units in the morning, you can write it. And he might tell you that, you know, I'm having amlodipine tablet, 5 milligram twice daily. You can write it. Poor drug compliance. This is also very important. Poor drug compliance and there is no history of any drug allergy. So that is the importance of drug history in this patient. Okay. Right. Next is personal history. Personal history. Um, so, you know, whatever points I told you about uh, a while back, uh, about when you conduct an exam for MBBS students, I request all of you 
at least you know when you become a senior please don't do this to your juniors because you are facing the scenario now but please don't reciprocate the same to your juniors that is the only thing you should do because what you will not get anything that is what you should take a promise today please uh, you know when you talk to your juniors you know you have that courtesy to them they are your colleagues junior colleagues see i always tell in my class i am teaching here and you are listening not because i am some superman it's only because i started earlier than you in 10 years from now in some conference you will be the speaker and i will be you know sitting in that uh, chair in the among the you know viewers of that conference attending to your conference and trying to learn from it okay so it's just that i started earlier i am here okay so that is again something which it's nothing philosophical it's something everybody should know it's a basic courtesy to all medical students okay personal history not a smoker not an alcoholic he consumes a mixed diet which is poor in fruits and vegetables bowel and bladder habits are regular no history of illicit drug abuse and no history of high risk sexual behavior this is important because you know uh, illicit drug abuse like say cocaine iv cocaine can predispose to stroke amphetamine can predispose to stroke high risk sexual behavior neurosyphilis can produce neurological manifestations hiv can produce neurological manifestations okay all this is important personal history family history there is a history of type 2 diabetes mellitus in the father mother brother and maternal uncle his father died due to stroke related complications at 60 years of age his mother had a history of myocardial infarction so it's very obvious that in the family so many people are having problems okay so diabetes is there stroke related complications for the father mother had a myocardial infarction now what about occupational history he is a pensioner with a monthly income of around 10000 and he is from a, a average socio economic status okay now we are done with the history now if you look at your workbook that i have given you you please see next is the case summary now this is something all my dear students should listen carefully see sometimes in the exam your examiner may not get enough time like for example your roll number is towards the end and then suddenly you come to the exam after studying the whole of history and then they are asking you okay tell me the summary of the case now this is something everyone should know the moment you finish the long case and you are waiting for your turn before you know your friend might be going before you what you have to do is you have to formulate a case summary anticipate that the examiner may ask you a case summary i am going to tell you how i would summarize this case i will wait for two full minutes you have to just summarize just quickly type in just summarize this case for me okay just summarize this case for me suppose you know we have listened to this no suddenly the examiner is asking you you summarize the case we have not gone into the examination but history you summarize that's what the examiner is asking how will you summarize okay i will tell you how you summarize look at this this is what i have as the this is what i will write as the summary for this case look at this 68 year old male with a long standing history of type 2 diabetes which is important because diabetes in that patient is present for 12 years so it's for long duration so when you have some got some long duration symptoms there is always a chance that long duration diabetes chance of stroke mi all are higher long standing history of type 2 diabetes systemic hypertension with poor drug compliance and a strong family history of vascular comorbidities you might ask me sir what sir why you are starting off with this sir why you are not starting off with the presenting complaints well you can summarize with the presenting complaints but if you are reasonably confident on the diagnosis you can set things up set things up means what 
what is the importance of this sentence? I am giving the examiner a background history of the patient straight away. So he is having a long-standing type 2 diabetes hypertension with poor drug compliance and a strong family history of vascular comorbidities. What is that vascular comorbidities? All the diabetes, stroke, MI that was there in the family, what are all they? They are all vascular comorbidities. So I'm just including them together and just telling them they are having history of vascular comorbidities. You write this down, case summary. Okay, so that means examiner gets an impression. Okay, you know how it is uh, to be presented in a summary. Now presents with, okay, he's the, the background is set. Now presents with, but at the same time, if the background is not very relevant, suppose there is no diabetes, no hypertension. Don't say this, don't say this. Okay, so you have to adjust accordingly. Okay, so cases like that. Otherwise, 68 year old female without any diabetes, without any hypertension, now presents with no. Only if there is, similarly, that is what I want you to know about the checklist aspect. I showed you a checklist. Don't think that you have to ask in that order alone. Why did I not ask sensory? Because that patient had speech and seventh nerve problem before that. So sensory will go down in the list. So all the positive will come up in the list and negative symptoms will go down in the list. This is the checklist. So out of this, whatever is positive should be presented first. And the final ones will become the negative history in a case. Okay, right. So now presents with an acute onset neurological illness of one day duration. See how beautifully it is coming. Don't say that, uh, sir, uh, patient present weakness of one second. That is totally when you are saying the full case. If you are summarizing, what is a summary? Summary means even without examiner hearing the rest of the history, he gets a fair enough idea. Fair enough idea on what has happened to the patient. Okay, so now presents with an acute onset. Each word is important. Acute onset neurological illness of one day duration, which started as an acute onset mild weakness of the right lower limb, progressing to a severe functional disability of right meplegia over four hours. So something which started as a mild deficit over four hours, it has evolved into a right hemiplegia. He also developed a right UMN facial palsy and a UMN dysarthria. No histories now. Coming to the negative history in a case summary. In the actual long case, you can tell adequate negative history. Remember, I know that some examiners may not like negative history. They may say, why you are asking all this? But you should be able to substantiate why you asked it. You must say, sir, this point, I asked for this. This point, I asked for this. Then examiner will not say anything because he understood. Okay, he, he said it for a reason and he was not just vomiting it out. Okay, so here also don't, you know, tell all the negative history in the case summary, but only the relevant one. Don't you think the history suggestive of a cardioembolic is important to mention? There is no embolic etiology. Why I'm saying there is no embolic etiology? I did not get any chest pain, palpitations, nothing like that. So, which is why there is no history suggestive of embolic. See, I am just telling you no history suggestive of embolic. Maybe when I examine, I may get a murmur. That time I might, or when I look at the pulse of the patient, there may be atrial fibrillation. But from the history, there is no, that is no embolic etiology. When I teach you the examination and then teach you another summary, which will combine the examination. Remember, this is a case summary based on history alone. Based on examination, you can include the points that I'll tell you in my next class, how you will combine both as the final case summary. Okay. So no history suggestive of embolic etiology, no history of a raised intracranial tension, which is important negative history. No other complications. The patient reached the hospital within nine hours of onset of symptoms. So you, maybe, you know, when you, uh, write all these points and you listen to my class. Don't you think when I look at this, I am getting a fair enough idea of the entire case. You tell me. Look at the case summary and see whether I am able to give you a fair enough idea of the entire case summary. Yes, no. Correct, no. Yes. Now, the final part. We are coming to the final part of the discussion. 
about the diagnosis part. You tell me what is the diagnosis here. I will wait for one minute. What is the diagnosis here? I'll wait for the diagnosis part. You tell me. Diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? Just type in the diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? Remember, see, you can make a diagnosis after the history. You can make after the examination. You might ask me, sir, why are you saying about diagnosis now? See, examiners in your exam may sometimes ask you after the history, you, they might ask you, what is your diagnosis now? It is definitely possible to make a diagnosis now, but maybe certain things will become more clear when I do the examination. But it is very possible to write the diagnosis now. Remember, when you write any diagnosis in neurology, you a diagnosis in neurology will have, not only neurology, majority of the systems will have, first you have to write what is the functional deficit of the patient. What is the functional deficit of the patient? Second is, you must say, what is the anatomical site of lesion? What is the anatomical site of lesion? Okay. Third is, what is the etiology? Don't simply write CVA. There is nothing like that. What is CVA? Simply, you know, in the discussion so far, I have ever, have I ever used this term CVA stroke. CVA stroke is there. CVA is just, you know, cerebrovascular accident, but that's not simply how you write the diagnosis. Okay. So let me see your diagnosis. One, somebody is telling ischemic stroke of thrombotic type. No, that's not how you write. You've got to have functional deficit, but definitely appreciate, you know, you answering. It's okay to go wrong. I always tell my students, it's okay to go wrong. But, you know, you've got to improve. So any diagnosis, we should have these three parts. Functional deficit. Now you tell me, I'm going to ask you a question. What is the functional deficit in this patient? You tell me. What is the functional deficit in this patient? You tell me. What is the functional deficit? Let's go to the history and then see what are the functional deficits. Well, the patient has got an acute onset right hemiplegia. Well, it started with lower limb, then upper limb. That's fine. But what is the functional deficit? Now, acute onset right hemiplegia. But always remember, my dear friends, diagnosis and summary are different. Summary means you have got to present. Diagnosis means very limited number of words. So what is the functional deficit? It is an acute, I'm, for, I'm going to teach you about each functional anatomic etiology and then you have got to combine all of them as the final diagnosis. Okay, so Fatima, do not write this is a case of. Okay, Ajish Raj, acute onset stroke syndrome. Ajish, write first functional deficit. Okay, acute onset right hemiplegia, right UMN facial palsy, UMN dysarthria. These are the functional deficits in this patient. These are the functional deficits in this patient. Did you understand? Did you understand? These are the functional deficits in this patient. Acute onset right hemiplegia, right UMN facial palsy, UMN dysarthria. Agree with me? Agree or not? This is the functional deficit. Now coming to anatomical site. So, see, anatomical site, what are the possible anatomical sites in any case? Cortex can be affected, subcortex can be affected, internal capsule affected, or brainstem. Anyway, it is not spinal cord because here the patient is having upper limb and lower limb problem, okay, and deviation of angle of mouth. So, it cannot be spinal cord, cortex, subcortex, internal capsule, or brainstem. What do you think? Where is the possible site of lesion? See, here you have got to use your logic. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, coming to cortex. Now, you tell me, is cortex a possible site or not in this case? Yes or no? Or what are the odd points against cortex? See, first of all, the patient is having a severe weakness. Severe weakness is unlikely in case of a cortical lesion. Because, see, what can happen here is, 
what can happen here is when you look at the motor homunculus of the body, you remember about the motor homunculus? See, motor homunculus is having such a representation. And if you have got to get a cortical lesion producing a severe weakness, it has to be a very big lesion. And if at all it was such a big lesion involving cortex, he would have had an altered sensorium. But we already know his sensorium is intact. So this is unlikely. So cortical severe weakness is a point against. Correct? Next is here now the upper limb and lower limb. Now it is almost fully involved. So there is a equal involvement of upper and lower limb. Equal involvement of upper and lower limb. So remember in case of corticulation, it is very rare to get a equal involvement of upper and lower limb. It is a very unequal involvement that you will get in case of a corticulation. So equal involvement means it doesn't happen. See, because when you look at the motor homunculus, when you get a stroke here, yes, the face and upper limb is involved, but the leg will be relatively spared. But if the stroke is in the other side, what happens is the leg is involved, the other part will not be there. So a very severe weakness is unlikely and uh, equal weakness is also unlikely. Okay. There is one point, you know, I just, I think, you know, I forgot to mention when I was describing the weakness. Okay. So just want to add one point to your note here. Okay. Sorry that I forgot to mention this. So in that history, I told, you know, dropping of objects and difficulty in raising upper limb. So dropping of objects means what? Is it distal weakness or proximal weakness? Distal weakness. So if I have a difficulty in raising upper limb, taking something from above, that is suggestive of a proximal weakness. So this patient is having distal plus proximal weakness. You tell me classically in a, a stroke case, will it be, or a UMN lesion, will it be predominantly distal weakness or proximal weakness? Predominantly distal or proximal? Predominantly distal. But remember, it need not be always like that. Some patients can have both distal and proximal weakness as well. Okay. So maybe you can add appearance of motor symptoms that is in the form of proximal plus distal weakness. Proximal plus distal weakness. Okay. Right. Okay. So anatomical side. So severe weakness, equal involvement. And that is so severe weakness is against, equal involvement is against. Okay. There is no seizure. No seizure. No aphasia. So shall I cut cortex? Yes or no? Shall I cut cortex? Severe weakness, equal involvement of upper and lower limb, no seizure, no aphasia. Can I cut it? Yes or no? If you tell only, I'll cut. Can I cut cortex as a possible anatomical site here? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that is done. Subcortical region. So here again, subcortex also. Yes, aphasia and seizure is not a feature of subcortical. But even that will have a unequal involvement. So even the first two points I mentioned here, that is the severe weakness and equal involvement of upper and lower limb that rules out subcortex or corona radiata. Because when I showed you corona radiata as well, I showed you in the picture. So that is why I showed you each anatomical structure, guys. There is a reason why I showed you all this. So when you get a lesion involving the corona radiata, lesion involving the corona radiata, so maybe the leg fibers will be involved or the upper limb fibers may be involved more. So it is, if it has to involve all the fibers, then it has to be a very big stroke of the corona radiata. So which is why again, a very severe weakness is unlikely that to be due to a, a very severe weakness is unlikely to be due to a subcortical lesion. <clears throat> okay. But again, anyway, the weakness is usually more than that of cortex. But this is not subcortex. Can I cut it? Yes or no? You tell me. Again, if you tell only, I'll cut. I am not convinced this is subcortex. 
Subcortex means coronal radiator. Can I cut it? Yes or no? You tell me. Okay. So I am going to cut subcortex as well. Internal capsule, severe weakness, equal involvement of upper and lower limb. Possible, right? UMN facial paralysis. Possible. Internal capsule. So I'm possibly thinking of internal capsule. I would entertain this. Let me keep it there. Let me go to brainstem. Now, what about brainstem? You know, is it a possible site or not? What is against a brainstem here? See, brainstem means mostly, not always, mostly there is cranial nerve involvement. So no cranial involvement except facial. So that means brainstem is unlikely. So already the patient is having UMN facial palsy. So just tell me, when there is a UMN facial palsy, I understood one thing. Lesion is above what level? Above pons. Because what? See, when I say UMN facial palsy, I get a conclusion that lesion is above pons. Because pons, you have got the facial nerve nucleus. When you get a lesion involving the pons, you will get only LMN facial. Correct? No. The facial nucleus affection is also LMN. So above pons. Above pons, it can be in the cortex, subcortex, internal capsule or midbrain. Right? So it's not brain stem because there is no other third nerve is not involved. Fourth is not involved. So you tell me, can I cut brain stem? You tell me. Because it's very important for me. I'm almost going to narrow down it internal capsule. So I've got to be very sure. You help me. Can I just cut it in brain stem? Brain stem, can I cut it? Yes or no? You tell me. Yes. So I am cutting brain stem. So the possible anatomical site of lesion here is the internal capsule. Okay. Now that is very, very important here. Okay. Anatomical site. Now, coming to the etiology here. Okay, coming to the etiology. Now, you might ask me, sir, can't it be a stroke that involves internal capsule and the cortex? Is it not possible? Well, this patient came with a right-sided weakness. Right? So, the left hemisphere most probably is getting affected. So, you tell me, are you expecting aphasia in this case if there is a cortical involvement? Yes, because left hemisphere. But at the same time, if it is a left-sided weakness, please don't say aphasia in your exam unless you are very convinced. Because rarely it can happen, as I told you a while back about the dominance concept. But otherwise, left hemiparesis, you are not expecting aphasia. Okay. So the problem here is, if it extended onto the cortex, I'm not getting any cortex features. And also, if it is a very large stroke involving internal capsule and cortex, it will definitely affect the consciousness level as well. Large strokes definitely will decrease consciousness. Not only hemorrhagic strokes. You might see in your small books that you prepare for practical exams, you know, hemorrhagic consciousness affected, ischemic consciousness not affected, nothing like that. Big ischemic stroke can affect consciousness. Okay. So <clears throat> don't rely on such books which are not very reliable as well. Okay. So this is the anatomical side. So functional is clear. Uh, anatomical side is also clear, which is the internal capsule. Which internal capsule? Left internal capsule or right internal capsule? Patient is having right-sided weakness. So left internal capsule. Left internal capsule. Right? Now coming to the etiology. So there are numerous etiologies which can produce such a manifestation. I am just giving you a list of etiologies. You tell me what is the likely etiology that is producing this one. Is it a vascular etiology, an abscess, a metastasis, a primary CNS neoplasm, infective cause or demyelination? Out of this, you are in favor of what? Vascular cause, abscess, metastasis, neoplasm. So vascular cause means there is a blood vessel affection. Essentially, I'm talking of a stroke. Vascular cause means blood vessel getting affected. Abscess means cerebral abscess. Metastasis means most commonly from, say, CA lung metastasis. Primary CNS neoplasm means maybe a meningioma. It is not metastasis. It is actually originating inside the brain. That is known as a primary CNS neoplasm. Meningioma or astrocytoma. Or infective like a tuberculoma, cysticercosis. Or a demyelination like a multiple sclerosis. 
So many are saying vascular. I see everyone saying vascular. Catherine, Fatima, Sharon, uh, Sri, Varun, everyone saying vascular. Why you said vascular? Why you said vascular? You tell me you are saying this is vascular. Why vascular? Because something very unique about the core is this of this case. It is very acute onset symptoms. So any acute onset symptom, highest possibility. I'm not saying it can never be a metastasis possible, but the, always you have got to go according to probability. Highest possibility is for a vascular cause, especially anything such dramatic onset. And also, I agree, you know, the other factors like, you know, the contributing in the family history, everything is correct. Okay, Faiz Musa, in view of the acute presentation, vascular cause, very good, excellent answer. Okay, so this is the etiology. But remember, when you write the diagnosis, not only about this functional anatomical side etiology, you have to write the comorbidities. You tell me what are the comorbidities in this patient? In this patient, what are the comorbidities? So etiology, I have decided it is stroke. What sort of stroke? Before I go to the comorbidities, you are tell me, is it ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke? Tell me that first. We'll go to thrombotic or embolic, but first of all, is it ischemic or hemorrhagic? Well, it is likely to be ischemic because hemorrhagic means, one point about hemorrhagic is you will have headache at the onset. Headache at the onset of stroke is highly suggestive of a hemorrhagic stroke. Well, headache, is it only seen with hemorrhagic stroke? No, it can very well be seen in a thrombotic stroke as well especially thrombotic stroke involving the larger blood vessels can produce a hemorrhage. I mean, it can produce a headache, possible. But if there is a headache at the onset of stroke, that is patient developing a severe headache and then a hemiplegia, it is likely to be hemorrhagic. So I am not seeing any hemorrhagic, but as my dear students, everyone are saying progressive nature, Sri uh, is telling so, very good. So, they are saying that there is a progressive nature of symptoms. So, as you rightly said, it is likely to be a thrombotic stroke because, I mean, ischemic stroke because I am not seeing any evidence of hemorrhage because ischemic is a more commoner one. Now, in ischemic, will I go for thrombotic or embolic? What do you think? Is it thrombotic or embolic? What do you think? Well, I am probably thinking of a thrombotic stroke. Can you tell me why? why I am thinking of a thrombotic stroke. I am thinking of a thrombotic stroke because this patient has a unique presentation. Can you tell me what it is? A unique presentation, which is highly suggestive of thrombotic, which is known as stroke in evolution. If you remember, the patient had a progressive nature of symptoms. After the initial while, two hours later, he got some new symptoms. Then another two hours later. So progressive nature of symptoms. My dear students, progressive nature of symptoms is highly suggestive of thrombotic. In embolic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, at the onset itself, patient will have the maximum deficit. Thrombotic is the one that progresses. But my dear students, do not confuse one point. Don't think that all cases of thrombotic is like stroke in evolution, nothing like that. There are cases of thrombotic stroke which present with full deficit at the onset as well. But I am just telling you, a stroke in evolution tells me that this is likely to be a thrombotic stroke. Okay, so that is about the etiology part. Now, what about the comorbidities? I've got a poorly controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus and also a systemic hypertension. Poorly controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus and systemic hypertension. Okay. But there is one more point I need to add in the etiology. I told it is an acute ischemic stroke. It is a thrombotic stroke. But there is one problem here. Uh, when it is not a wake-up wake up stroke. You look at the history. Did I say it is a wake-up stroke? When he woke up at 6 a.m., he was completely normal. No. So in etiology, tell me where there is one more point. Which blood vessel is affected? See, which is the major blood supply to the cerebral hemispheres? I'm just going to quickly recap in two minutes about the important blood supply of the brain. 
So you look at this figure where you see the arch of aorta. On the right side, you are seeing a brachiocephalic artery, which will give rise to the subclavian artery and the common carotid artery. Subclavian artery and the common carotid artery. And then you have got the common carotid artery dividing into internal carotid and external carotid. On the left side, rather than a single brachiocephalic trunk, there are separate branches of common carotid artery and subclavian. Almost same as the other side, only thing is that there was no common brachiocephalic trunk. And from this, you have got the common carotid and subclavian artery. And here you can see common carotid dividing into internal carotid and external carotid. Now tell me, you tell me, is it internal carotid or external carotid that mainly supplies the brain? Is it internal carotid or external carotid that supplies the brain? It is the internal carotid artery. Is the entire brain supplied by the branches of internal carotid artery? No, because you see here the subclavian artery. You saw the subclavian artery. From the subclavian artery, let me just highlight in green, there is another blood vessel that will go up through the foramen transverse area. What is it called? Vertebral artery. Vertebral artery. So vertebral artery is also very, very important. So vertebral artery will ascend up. Correct? Vertebral artery will ascend up. Another view, just the same thing, telling you that anteriorly, I am showing in blue, the carot internal carotid is there and then it goes as branches. Then you have got the vertebral as well, I am showing in green, its branches. So will you agree with me, the two major blood vessels that supply the brain are, one is the internal carotid artery and next is the internal carotid artery and its branches. And next is the vertebral artery and its branches. So the anterior part of the brain is mainly supplied by the branches of the internal carotid artery. The posterior part is mainly by the vertebral artery and its branches. So this part is known as the anterior circulation. So any stroke which involves blood vessels in the anterior part is called the anterior circulation stroke. The other one is a posterior circulation stroke. For example, for example, let me show you the circle of villus here. Let me show you the circle of villus. So you see here, this is the internal carotid artery and the branches of internal carotid artery being the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, the ophthalmic artery, the anterior choroidal artery, and the posterior communicating artery. These are the branches of the internal carotid artery. What about the vertebral artery? The vertebral artery joins to form, this is the vertebral artery, joins together to form the basilar artery. Okay. And you've got certain branches like superior cerebellar, anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, but that is coming from the vertebral artery. Okay. Then you've got the labyrinthine artery small pontine arteries. So these are arteries and also finally the posterior cerebral arteries. So these are the vessels which are in the posterior circulation of brain. Now, if I draw a line like this, if I draw a line, if there is a stroke in front of this line, that is ACA stroke, MCA stroke, anterior coronal artery stroke, all that are known as anterior circulation strokes. All these are known as anterior circulation strokes. The other ones are known as posterior circulation strokes. I can see many students are commenting in the chat box. Okay. <laughs> so somebody is asking students are still alive. Do you guys even sleep? Okay, so, right. So I'm also happy to see students alive. Uh, even at this time, we are almost uh, nearing two o'clock. I'm happy to see all of you are enthusiastic. Okay, so okay, so either it means you are enthusiastic or I am teaching well, or it has to be a combination. Okay, right. So you see here once again, I'm just showing you 
the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation. And what is the bridge between the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation? It is the posterior communicating artery, PCOM. Okay, so the posterior communicating artery is the one that divides anterior from posterior. So any blood vessel that is getting, you know, in front of that is the anterior circulation stroke and the other is posterior circulation. Now, what I want you to understand, you know, when you want to localize which blood vessel is getting involved, you have got to know a few points by common sense. Okay, you've got to go know a few points by common sense. Now, I'm just going to show you a few pictures of the cerebral hemisphere. So one is the lateral cerebral hemisphere. You are seeing a yellow color, blue color, and uh, uh, orange color. Okay, uh, yeah, you can call it some sort of an orange. So that is the lateral cerebral hemisphere. So out of this, you tell me, you see the large yellow region, which means majority of the blood supply in that region is by a particular blood vessel. Okay, what is that blood vessel? This blood vessel is known as the middle cerebral artery. This one is the ACA. This one is the PCA. So MCA, ACA, PCA. MCA, ACA, PCA. Okay, right? These are the blood vessels in the lateral hemisphere. What about medial hemisphere? You have got smaller contribution from MCA, larger contributions from ACA, PCA, MCA. If you look at the inferior surface, larger contribution is from the other vessel, that is PCA, then MCA, this is ACA. Okay. Now, if a patient has a motor cortex involvement, okay, you know this is motor cortex is located in the precentral gyrus. So this is where it is located. So you tell me now, I'm just waiting for your answer. The motor cortex, which is mainly located here, is mainly supplied by which blood vessel? You tell me. Okay. Mainly supplied by which blood vessel? Mainly supplied by which blood vessel? Mainly supplied by which blood vessel? Yes, this is mainly supplied by middle cerebral artery. So if a patient has got a very severe weakness, okay, uh, the likely blood vessel is the middle cerebral artery. Anterior cerebral artery stroke can also produce weakness. But the problem is ACA strokes will predominantly have a leg weakness. The reason is because if you look at the motor homunculus, you know the medial surface, as I already told you, is mainly supplied by the anterior cerebral artery. So the anterior cerebral artery strokes will be like this, where predominantly it is the leg area that is getting involved, which is why patients with ACA strokes can present with the contralateral weakness of the lower limb alone. Now you might ask me, sir, you are saying that this is MCA, but MCA does not supply leg area. Then how this patient that you told is having leg weakness? Remember, you are seeing some beautiful diagrams now, no? ACA territory, MCA territory, a beautiful demarcated line. That is not something what actually happens in real life. Sometimes what can happen is you can have, you can have MCA supplying some part of leg as well. So don't think that MCA strokes will not involve leg. It can definitely involve the leg as well. Okay. So one thing you tell me, you tell me, is it likely to be MCA, AC or PCA that is getting involved? PCA is mainly supplying or the posterior circulation, the other blood vessels, which that discussion will come in the next uh, lecture where I discuss the examination part. I'll tell you how to localize the brain stimulations. We'll come to that. Don't worry. Everything step by step. So what I want you to understand is about the course of middle cerebral artery, because you want to tell me, or you should tell me where in the middle cerebral artery is the stroke. Let me just try to trace the middle cerebral artery here. So you look at the middle cerebral artery, that is, this is the internal carotid. And from there, the MCA is going laterally. Okay, this is the MCA. And MCA will divide in the sylvian fissure. And subsequently, it ends by dividing into a superior division and inferior division. This is the normal course of a middle cerebral artery. This section is known as what? Coronal section. So you've got a sagittal section, you've got a coronal section. So you must understand that there is a coronal section here and this is the middle cerebral artery course. Now, 
you are very convinced that this is an internal capsulation. My dear students, please understand that the blood supply of the internal capsule is from the middle cerebral artery predominantly, not entirely, but predominantly. In the region of the internal capsule, you can see that from the MCA, there are certain small vessels which are coming. And these small vessels which originate from the middle cerebral artery, they are known as very good. As I can see in the comment section, they are known as lenticulostriate vessels. Lenticulostriate vessels. These lenticulostriate vessels are the ones which supply the internal capsule. Though these are very small vessels, if there is an occlusion in any of the vessel, though their vessels are small, the impact is big. Can someone tell me why the impact is big? So suppose if I have got a blood clot in one of the lenticlostriate artery versus a blood clot in one of the superior divisions of middle cerebral artery, what can happen is the impact is in the lenticlostriate artery. The reason is because the lenticlostriate artery is going to supply the internal capsule, okay, which is why the weakness is there. So if I am going to mark a few structures, regions, okay, so let me just mark a few regions. This is one, okay, the initial lesion. This is two. And this lenticlostriate is three. And the proximal part of the proximal part of the MCA is four. You tell me one, two, three, four. Where is the likely lesion? Is it one, two, or three or four? Well, it is not one because one is supplying the cortex. So definitely it is not the superior division of MCA, the one that you're talking about. It's not the superior division, neither is it the inferior division. Okay, no. It is two means what? Two is the region after the lenticlostriate. If two is getting blocked, do you think internal capsule would be affected? No, because middle cerebral artery has already given the lenticlostriate vessels. So it is not going to be two, because if two was affected, definitely internal capsule will be spared. Three, three is definitely a possibility because though the lenticlostriate is affected, you are having a internal capsule lesion. So why this patient is having a dysarthria? See, dysarthria because, see, I told you for the articulation, you need the swiggy delivery boys. So the corticospinal tract is there. If there is a lesion, you will have a dysarthria which is why the patient is having a UM and dysarthria because the internal capsule is affected and the corticospinal tract is going through that. Now the next, can someone tell me, can it be four or not? Can it be four or not? Okay, can it be four or not? Now four, if it happens, well, four, isn't that a possibility? When four is affected, it is a proximal stroke involving the middle cerebral artery. So there is a chance that entire this region gets infarcted, including lenticlostriate. So don't you think, rather than saying lenticlostriate, for all my dear friends who said lenticlostriate, don't you think there is a possibility that this is a proximal occlusion of the middle cerebral artery and the entire region is infarcted? Isn't that a possibility? Isn't that a possibility you tell me? It is not. Because if that was a possibility, number one, such a big stroke would have produced altered alteration of the consciousness for sure because here the patient was conscious definitely it's a large stroke it will produce alteration of consciousness second if it is a proximal mca not only will the lenticlostriate be affected the cortical branches also will be affected so if the cortical branches are affected you will have symptoms accordingly so what sort of symptoms you may have aphasia seizures you might ask me sir how there is a reason why. Let me tell you. If you look at this lateral view of the cerebral hemisphere, so let me just show you that this is the middle cerebral artery, MCA, dividing into superior division and inferior division. See, this is a superior division of MCA. This is the inferior division of MCA. Now, there is an important language area located here. 
there is an important language area located here. What is this one? This is Broca, this is Wernicke. So the superior division of the MCA is supplying which region? The Broca surface here. Inferior division of MC, Wernicke, Broca's area. The inferior division of MCA is supplying which region? Wernicke's area. So if there is a stroke that involves the dominant hemisphere, superior MCA division, patient has to have a Broca surface here. If the patient has a stroke involving the inferior division, which means this is what I am talking about. Wait, let me just show you. So you look at this MCA superior division, MCA inferior division. So MCA inferior division should produce Wernicke surfacea. MCA superior division should produce Broca surfacea. Now tell me, if four was the alt, four is the site of lesion. What is the aphasia that is expected? I'm waiting. Okay. If four is the site of lesion, what is the aphasia that is expected? If four is the site of lesion, what is the aphasia that is expected? Four is the site of lesion. What is the aphasia that is expected? Four is the site of lesion. What is the aphasia that is expected? Global, fantastic, beauty, beauty, very good. Global aphasia is expected. So now you know which is the blood vessel that is affected in global aphasia. So you guys are now becoming experts. Now you can tell which blood vessel is involved. Okay. So in this patient, however, I am very sure that this is not a, you know, any aphasia or cortical. So I'm very sure that it is definitely lenticulostriate. So what is my final provisional diagnosis for this case? The functional deficit, first I will write. First, now I am going to combine everything. Acute onset right hemiplegia, right UMN facial palsy, UMN dysarthria. What is the site of lesion? Left internal capsule lesion. It's, don't simply write stroke, okay? You have got to write like this because who knows, this might sometimes turn out to be a demyelination involving the internal capsule region. So in that case, only the third part you will get wrong. Functional deficit, anatomical etiology. But if you simply say stroke, you take the MRI out and you find that demyelination, you will be embarrassed. So remember, everything in medicine has an order. So please tell the functional deficit. What is the anatomical site of lesion? Then what is the etiology? What is the etiology? It is an acute ischemic stroke, possibly thrombotic. Why do I say thrombotic? I already told you. Affecting the lefticulostriate branch of the left middle cerebral artery. That is the etiology. And finally, comorbidities, poorly controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus, systemic hypertension. If their patient had some smoking or had some diabetes, well, you can write that as well. If the patient had some smoking or had diabetes, you can write as well. This is how you will write the diagnosis. This is how you will write the diagnosis. Remember, it's a process. It's a process and you learn it through practice. Okay. And you write a beautiful diagnosis, examiner will be very much interested. You simply write CVA right hemiplegia. What sort of diagnosis is that? It is absolute nonsense diagnosis. It does not convey anything. Okay. That is the important point. Okay, because see, I know that many of the students here, you know, you will be, you know, attending, say, a coaching class as well. There also you might have heard severe right hemiplegia. Please remember, though with no disrespect to anyone, they may not be actually teaching clinicians. They will be reading a textbook. They will not be seeing patients. My point is always clear. How can someone who doesn't see patients teach you clinical medicine? Medicine is a clinical subject. Okay, so the point is, Whichever platform you follow, just make sure one thing, you learn medicine from a clinician, okay? So that you understand the subject. Otherwise, it is like someone who never sees patient, has never treated himself, you know, a case of heart failure, is teaching you heart failure. Person has not himself treated heart failure. He is teaching you how to treat a heart failure. He has never seen a patient with stroke and he's teaching you how to treat a stroke. So that is where, you know, you get wrong information. So please don't go behind wrong information. 
I am just telling you this because I see many students learning the wrong things nowadays. Okay, okay, this is severe right hand inferior. What severe right hand inferior? Nothing like that. Okay, so this is how you have to say the provisional diagnosis, right? And that is important. You know, always remember Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one. E only if you cannot explain some symptoms by one lesion alone, then you think of possibility of multiple lesions. Otherwise, the simplest explanation is always the correct explanation. Did you understand? Right? So that is very important. Now, this is very important because sometimes, suppose, you know, etiology might change according to the age as well. Suppose you get a patient who, who is having a young age. In our patient, it was a 68-year-old male. But what if it is a young patient with a stroke? Then the possible etiologies that you will be thinking of will be slightly different. You can think of valvular heart disease, maybe atrial MS, mitral stenosis with atrial fibrillation producing a stroke, infective endocarditis producing a stroke, vasculitis like SLE producing a stroke, APLA syndrome producing a stroke, dissection, carotid dissection producing a stroke, AV malformation producing stroke, hypercoagulable states like protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency producing stroke, hyperhomocysteinemia producing stroke, sickle cell anemia producing stroke, neurosyphilis producing vasculitis and producing stroke, cocaine and amphetamine drug abuse producing stroke. So the set of etiologies will be different. Why I'm giving you this list is because many a times in your exam, the examiner asks you regarding the causes of young stroke. So these are the causes of young stroke. Okay. Yes. Right. So thereby we come to the end of this session where we have come to a conclusion on how to uh, analyze symptoms and uh, write a provisional diagnosis as well. Okay. So uh, I hope that uh, the session was uh, useful for you. Uh, it might have been an elaborate session, but this is, as I told you a while back, it is the only session that you need to attend in your life, okay, for a history taking a hemiplegia. And uh, if you have any queries, uh, your feedbacks, anything, you can WhatsApp me, 9447-3349444. Uh, my Insta ID is dr underscore Rahul underscore Rajiv. So uh, you will get uh, my academic updates in the Insta page. I've got a Telegram group as well. So in case you are watching this later, you know, the PDF I'll be sharing in, I've already shared in my Telegram group. So please join my Telegram group. If you're not there, you know, please just WhatsApp me as well. I'll send you the link as well. But uh, just let me know whether you feel happy. Remember, after every session, uh, I ask my students uh, whether you feel happy or not. Uh, do you feel more confident on how you should analyze a case and how much information you can get from the history and uh, how you can draw conclusions in a systematic manner? Okay. So... Uh, I hope this session was useful. Thank you so much, everyone, also for joining. And uh, at 2 a.m. in the morning to have uh, such a crowd with me, I am so happy. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, yeah, so uh, I want all of you to think like clinicians, okay? This is very important because uh, the subject of medicine is so beautiful, so beautiful, but there is a particular way to love medicine. Okay. If you love it in the right way, it will love you back. Otherwise, you know, it will always show you a hesitancy or a rejection. So uh, I feel that um, this is a, a subject has to be learned like this, whatever be the case. When I teach you the subsequent cases as well, Next class will be on the examination, but every system that I teach you uh, is uh, going to be in this manner. I don't want you to muck up and uh, learn something for exam. No, you are the future. You are the future generation. You need to understand it better. 
so that let's all try you and me everyone is improving i don't say that i am perfect i am also trying to improve but whatever my teachers have taught me and uh, that is what i'm trying to teach you uh, thank you everyone uh, so whatever good words you have said uh, is uh, again uh, my tribute to my teachers because only uh, because my teachers uh, uh, taught me this i am able to teach you as well so uh, not my credit alone okay so thank you so much everyone right so feel free to contact me for anything and um, just uh, uh, feel free uh, to ask me doubts as well uh, i'll be happy to answer right any other queries you have regarding what i taught you today any queries Right. Okay, done. Happy? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, it was lovely interacting with you. So the time is uh, past uh, 2 a.m., but that's fine. As long as uh, you found the session uh, useful, uh, that's it. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.